All right, looks like we're ready to go. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the um, Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022 meeting of the Edina City Council. It is 7.04. Uh, preliminary to starting the meeting, uh, folks, I think maybe heard our uh, communications director, uh, Jennifer Benerot, but if you are watching the meeting on cable TV or at edinamn.gov live meetings or on Facebook, You'll have a couple opportunities to participate in the meeting this evening. One of them is during um, public comment, community comment, and then the other is public uh, public hearings. There's one public hearing matter this evening. Uh, you can call 888-504-7949. The number is on the screen, and a participant code is there as well. Press 416427. Press star 1 on your telephone keypad to speak to the operator. And then the operator will introduce you and uh, Director Benerot will bring you in to speak to the council when we get to those appropriate portions of the agenda. Remember, with respect to uh, community comment, you cannot speak to the council this evening on something that's on the agenda already or scheduled for a future public hearing. So having provided that information, I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask our clerk, Sharon Allison, to call the roll. Councilmember Anderson? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Here. Councilmember Pierce? Here. Councilmember Stoughton? Here. Mayor Hovland? Here. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, everyone. Um, <coughs> We've got a, a form of meeting agenda in front of us this evening. Is there anyone on the council or uh, from the staff standpoint that wishes to modify the agenda in any form or fashion? Hearing nothing, is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as shown? So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Member Staunton, second by Member Pierce to approve the meeting agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approval of the meeting agenda as shown say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now we are back to uh, community comment. So, folks, if you want to um, talk to the council about something that's on your mind of concern to you, uh, whether you're in the chambers or you are um, uh, uh, tuning in in the virtual world, uh, if you're calling in 888-504-7949, there's the number up on the screen. We're going to handle folks uh, in the audience first. Uh, passcode is 416427. Keep that in mind. And now we're going to go to folks that uh, might want to address the council on a matter of concern to them. That's not on the agenda tonight or scheduled for a future public hearing. So, ma'am, please come forward. My name's Ruth Ann Metzger. I live at 5600 Dale Avenue in the Melody Lake A area. And as you know from last council meeting, we don't have grass yet from our project from last year. We also have additional concerns. We have had to water our own yards since July 18th. We have not seen a water truck since then. And after July 18th, within that week, I was receded twice by the contractor. So I have spent 22 hours watering my yard, and we are wondering if the city is going to cut us a break in our watering bills. And what happens if this, now we're into the herbicide phase of plan B, I call it. And if that doesn't work, what's the plan after that? Uh, and will we have grass by the end of the season? Our 2021 project is not complete. The railroad tracks on Hanson Road 
through that intersection, the road has not been reconstructed. The sidewalk to Hanson Road is not complete. The intersection of 56th and Dale is horrible. In fact, today I had another big construction truck go from Dale onto 56th through my corner yard and level three of the stakes I have put up there to protect the yard. So we are wondering in my neighborhood if we are gonna be assessed before our project is complete. And the fire hydrant that has been moved from the north side of 56th Street to the intersection, which is on the south side, in the bump out, the big trucks are hesitant to even try to back up to be able to stay in the street when they turn the corner because they potentially would hit the fire truck. And I've been out in the yard working multiple times to see the big cement trucks go to turn the corner. They lift up their back wheels but they still can't make the corner. So I just want to make sure the city is aware of these open items from last year's project. And my neighborhood is not pleased with the outcome to date. Ms. Metzger, hold on just a moment. I want to make sure I understand that turning problem. Is that, I, and I've been to your house. I spent time walking both sides of your house because of the email that you sent a while back uh, articulating all of these things, I thought, in great detail. So I wanted to see where the, the um, problems were uh, on the towards Hanson Road, uh, you know, where you said I think the um, fire hydrants have been st uh, stacked and other material have been stacked in your yard. In the backyard along uh, 56th Street where the sidewalk is. But when you added. talk about that turning problem, uh, are you talking about when they come up from Hanson Road and then they want to turn on Dale? Nope, it's from Dale on to 56th Street on to going 56, west. Going westbound. Uh -huh. Okay. Because they want to get to Hanson. Okay. And we've got a demo in our neighborhood and there are very many construction trucks, cement trucks, garbage trucks, and even the school buses will have trouble once school starts up because with the group home and the way Dale is configured with that bump out, the group home worker or workers park on Dale as close as they can to the corner, which then takes away room for people to swing wide, going either from Dale to 56th or 56th to Dale. I noticed that when I was over there and Chris Raffidal, one of your neighbors, and I talked about that problem, and I think they potentially tried to address that in a traffic safety report, but we're gonna pull that off the agenda this evening and, and take a look at that. I'm not sure that we've got that figured out right yet. Thank you, I agree yeah. you don't. <laughs> and, then, and then if you, uh, you don't have to stay around for the whole meeting, but this is a topic we're taking up at the end of the meeting this evening and the city manager and the city engineer are gonna talk about what their ideas are. Uh, in fact, I suppose we could talk about it now. I'm sure still mm -hmm. here, so you don't have to tune in and, and, nice. and uh, wait until 9:30 or 10 o'clock at night to hear. So, if you want to just uh, sit down and, and uh, we'll we'll talk about this issue okay. right now because we've well, got. Well, thank you for coming to our neighborhood yeah. and seeing firsthand, yeah, and, and thank you for listening. They've to got me. some ideas, and I don't know if we're all on the same page yet. But I understand your issue, and we're thinking about the, the watering that you've all done too, and it's gonna be pretty easy, I think, to at least have a conversation with the council about how, if we wanted to do something to help you on the water bill, determining what your historic use was compared to what it's been during this period is pretty simple. Yep. So I we'll agree. talk about that too. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, so stand by and we'll get to this. Let's see if anybody else wants to address the council. It's in chambers. All right, and then let's go online to see if anybody's waiting to speak to the council on um, community comment. I do not have anyone on the line, sir. Okay, let's let's talk about this issue. I don't know if Director Milner wants to take this. Or he does. Manager yeah. Neal wants to go first. I mean, you know, our, our normal practice when we when we take community comment is we don't generally respond because we want to have time to prepare and give an accurate, fully accurate uh, response. In this case, I think we were safe to anticipate that this question would be raised tonight, so we did. And I talked to to uh, Director Milner earlier today, and he's going to give some background and also uh, talk to you a little 
little bit about uh, the plan and, and the communication steps that have taken place already. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, definitely prepared to answer the questions this evening. I think first, apologizing to the neighborhood. You know, we're sorry of the outcome from the contractor. They have not met the requirements we put forth uh, for that north half of the project. South half of the project looked great. It looks like it's been sodded, and what they did for that definitely turned out. So I want to just emphasize that we do have a contract with the contractor. We don't tell them means and methods. We tell them outcomes. So the contractor chose not to do uh, dormant seating last fall. They said they would be back out bright and early in May. They did not show up, even though repeated communications. They had labor issues, material issues, equipment issues. They had excuses. So they did not get out there till late June late or early July to do the seating. Well, that is totally outside the, the window of when seating should be done, but they thought they'd try it anyway to see if the summer would be a little wetter and they would probably have the results that they were hoping for. Well, hope doesn't get us to turf, that's acceptable. So we're continuing to manage the contractor to the contract. We did have discussions with the city attorney that were close to that level where we could say that they're in breach of contract, but we feel like this is no additional cost right now on us. It's no additional cost to the residents. We still have a window where they could uh, address the weeds and, and do the seeding in that window that's recommended at late August. So in my opinion, we should let them do the plan. They put together a plan. We had a third party come out and review it this week, actually last week. A landscape architect with a degree in turf management came out and said, yep, I see the situation. We told him the story of what has happened thus far. We showed him the plan and, and he agrees like it should get grass to the year acceptable levels by, by late fall if you follow that plan. So we're confident that not only the contractor understands what needs to be done, this third party review also has done that. I know there's been discussion about sod. Sod's not in the contract. So if we decided to go to sod, we'd have to tell the contractor to you're, you're no longer wanted on the project. We'd have to go for bids, and we estimate it's over a half a million dollars to come in now and resod because we have to remove two inches of topsoil. We're most likely going to damage the irrigation systems, dog fences, and have to redo all that work. So, again, it's not a cost right now to manage the contract and contractor and have them continue to do this. This was a similar situation we saw in 2016 in Strachauer. It was a drought year, weeds were this tall. I was doing the same discussion with the council. We showed pictures, in fact, we showed pictures before and after there, and they did this operation, similar operation, and the turf did respond by that fall and next spring. But I think the key is turf takes, whether it's sod or seed, two to three years. We need the residents, like Ruth, watering years from now to keep establishing that turf. We're gonna get it to a point where it's growing. They need to continue that management, weed management and watering in the future. We know if we do sod, 30% of the lots, if there's a drought, it's dead. It's gone and it's completely brown because we know 30% of the people do not have irrigation systems, so we have a concern on that. We are doing research right now to come back to you this fall to see if, from a sustainability standpoint, from our climate action goals, from, from the triple bottom line when we look at societal impacts of all the stuff we've been dealing with, with emails and staff time and all that, maybe it makes sense to do sod. So we're trying to get our hands around that again. We were up here in 2016 talking about it. So we're six years from there and let's see what new research is out there and come forward. To answer some of the questions uh, that Ruth had, the reason Hanson isn't done in 56, CP Rail. We have been trying to get a permit from CP Rail for 18 months and we finally got it two weeks ago. So that issue, we wanted to do it, we couldn't do it, they wouldn't give us a permit and they had just been a black hole trying to communicate with, but we finally have it. Contractors coming in in September is gonna finish the road. We still don't know when they're gonna do the crossing because they do that work themselves. Um, so the project will be complete this fall, um, but it was CP Rail delaying that one portion of, of the project there, so. I think I answered most of it, but I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Yeah. Go ahead, Major. Just one, one additional point that she made that we have had some discussion on, and that is how we handle excessive watering. Okay. Uh, because we are and we do need to engage homeowners to help us yep. with this, with kind of the finishing um, 
product here. We have been talking to our utility staff about how do we accomplish this, and we can accomplish it, but it's probably setting up, we need to set up some parameters about uh, what time period we're talking about and, and what percentage of water use we want to discount. And, and so we do want to put some thought into that so that we're not um, a moving target on that. We want to be able to produce um, a message that we can explain to different residents uh, throughout the project areas. Correct. We've so done we are some, working on that. Yep, and we've yep. done some calculations. If they water every day for this size, how much water, looking at the thing and just coming up with some, some draft numbers at this point. But we'll come back later in the fall when we understand the full extent of, of the watering need here for the rest of the year. Okay. Um, Ms. Metzger, can you move over a little bit so I can see you from the <laughs> dais? Is I, yeah, there, move up in that front row. Or, there you go. Thanks. Um, so here's, from having been out there, uh, and walking the neighborhood, um, here, here are my additional concerns. So, and let's get this uh, straight in my mind and everybody else's mind. Uh, you're you're going to kill the weeds. The contractor is going to kill all that existing weed material. Correct. Right? It's already, you can go out there and see it's already starting to dry. All right. So that's a 21-day proposition, exactly. as I understand it. And then you're going to till the soil and make it in a, create a condition where it can theoretically accept uh, hydro seeding again? Is that what we're gonna do? There's various states. Some properties have better seed growth already, so we don't wanna destroy the existing grass. So it might Understood. be a raking operation versus a tilling operation. So we're gonna look at the property and decide what's the best avenue. But yes, sure. we're gonna get yeah. it ready for seed. And then it's gonna be a hydro seed Thanks. with a, with a uh, uh, fertilizer, liquid fertilizer in there and organics and the seed mix and blowing that out into the thing. Similar to what they did last year and the results were great. So that's what we want to do again on the north half, the results we got on the south half. All right. I like that customization idea to, because when I was out there, a lot of people have been had taken it on themselves and spent yeah. countless hours working in their yard to try to, uh, you know, reseeding, yeah. watering on their own. Some people have put in sod. I think we need to be mindful of that and think about that uh, as a potential reimbursable cost. Um, it, uh, it, for me, it, from being out there an hour and a half or so and talking to folks, it, it's on us now. And we got we got a contract, right? Yeah. But uh, for me, the buck stops here, and we got to do it right. And so, uh, when you go to reseed, that's another 21 days. So we're going to be at the end of September. Correct. Before we know whether we got any grass. Yep. And so what happens then if we don't get the kind of catch on the grass that we want? We don't get the kind of germination we want. Yeah. I mean, at this point, it's no additional cost to the contract. So let's, and I don't think we can get anybody to sod this year anymore anyway, labor and materials and everything. So let's try it at no cost and review it before winter, right? We want to get documentation of what's out there before winter and see the germination rates and the quality of it. We'll broadcast that to the neighborhood and say we think these are adequate starting points and then we look again in the in the spring and see where it's at at that point all right and determine if it's if it's good or if it, if it look i don't see how it can look like it does now but maybe there's a few spots that need another additional blast of hydro seed or something like that so i don't have a lot of confidence that the contractor is going to keep that new material moist to allow it to its best chance of germinating. So are you suggesting that residents water their own? Yes, we are. We're putting in that in our flyers. We really need their help here. And okay. that's why we'll consider the we'll water bill. At, we'll look yep. at water yep. bill yep. issues. Yep. And I think we should think about the same thing for people that bought multiple bags of seed and if they can produce receipts, we ought to be thinking about things that allow us to reimburse them for some of the labor would be a tough thing, I think, you know, but We're some even, of those hard costs could be could be reimbursable. We're even thinking of buying hoses, sprinklers in this because for the amount of time and effort we've spent just managing this thing, we could have bought enough for everybody, put them on timers and been done with it, got them a reduction on their water bill, taking the equipment back for the next year's project. So we're looking at some potential mechanism like that where, where we give them the tools to do it. And if they don't use it then, that's a different okay. story because we know. Ms. Metzger, come on back up because I want to make sure we got every issue covered here. Mayor, you saw my yard. You saw what I need to water. I would like to be the pilot for that temporary above-ground irrigation system with timers. Okay. I also want to be able to take a vacation, which I haven't done at all this year. 
So yes, I would definitely like to be the pilot and I think my yard would be a good okay. case because it's a mixture of shade, sun, corner, high traffic. Yeah, okay, and then we'll talk about this uh, parking issue and the inability to make the turn too. Pardon? We'll talk about the parking issues uh, later in the meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks for coming in tonight. All right. Um, we don't have anything else from community comment standpoint. So uh, the usual practice, is, as Manager Neal said, is to respond to community comments from the prior meeting. Manager Neal, anything that you need to respond to? Um, yes, sir. Uh, we had a resident last at uh, our July 19th meeting who talked about this topic and, and encouraged us to uh, take it on. So that was uh, something we have done since then. Uh, Arnie Bigby was here and, and thanked the council for uh, so the support of the Juneteenth holiday and talked about that a bit. Uh, we had a question about the status of the uh, replacement of the pedestrian bridge over uh, the crosstown. Um, we received, the, the mayor received a response earlier this week from MnDOT that they have uh, awarded a contract for the steel work, for the uh, structural work of the of the metal uh, that supports the bridge uh, to fix the bridge, but not to replace the bridge. So we do know that is uh, going forward. And uh, there was a question about the status of Fire Station 3, what progress report, and we don't have any status, or we don't have any progress to report on Station 3. We are still working very much on Station 2 and uh, trying to get that project up and going. And you're gonna take an action, I think, later tonight that uh, helps get that project moving forward still. So that's what we had last time. Yeah, good. Any questions from council members as a result of that report? All right. Let's move on to the consent agenda. Uh, we've got two items that uh, council members have said we wanted to uh, remove from the consent agenda for further discussion. It's um, uh, 6N as in Nancy and O. Um, anything else? Any council members want to remove from the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items N and O? So moved. Second. second. Member Jackson moves, Member Anderson seconds the adoption of the consent agenda ex with the exception of items uh, 6N and 6O. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda except for 6N and 6O say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, and the reason I pulled a traffic safety report, that little sidebar with uh, Member Staunton, uh, and this relates to um, what Ms. Metzger was talking about. I wasn't sure that um, we got this right over there yet on, uh, on Dale in terms of the, of the parking. Uh, and I don't know if anybody can opine on that or not. Um, and it, let me find the item here. Mayor, I can I can speak to that. Yeah, item. thank you. Page three. So, page three. Mayor, members of council, we had a, a traffic safety request, and the request was for concerns with parking on 56th Street. Right. So we made the committee made that change. You can see we're adding a no parking sign between the driveway and that corner on 56th. The situation that was brought up this evening that wasn't part of the request. So I'm going to go back and we'll review that situation on. Dale Street, on Dale. and maybe we have a, an amendment, but at least we're going to put the no parking here now, and maybe there's additional stuff that happen, has to happen on Dale. So that wasn't part of the original request. Yeah, I think the the email I received talked about the whole block between I think Dale and Hanson on 56 that it wasn't good enough just to do part of the block. So as you go back to look at that. Maybe that has to do with what Ms. Metzger was talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'll look at the turning movements yeah. the, the, between Dale and Hanson was narrowed for the sidewalk. So yeah. there's no parking on that section, but then there's this parking issue right at Dale. So we'll look at that. Oh, right. Okay. So we know we have addressed at least that one car that's parking on 56th okay. when we put the sign up. Great. Right. I don't know why they don't park in the driveway at the group home, but they park on Dale and they park in a way where it, it really creates difficulty with the narrowness of the yep. street and the curve. So I think on either side of Dale, you got to look at it. Okay, we will do. Okay. All right. Uh, having provided that uh, information, thank you, Director Milner. Uh, anybody care to move the adoption of the traffic safety report of June 28, 2022, which is item 6N? So moved. Second. 
Got a motion by Member Staunton, uh, second by Member Jackson to adopt item 6N, which is the approval of the traffic safety report of June 28, 2022. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then O uh, deals with um, a request that we've had uh, regarding uh, joining a fencing consortium, a joint powers agreement, potential joint powers agreement. I'll turn to Member Staunton. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, chief, welcome. Um, I, I just wanted to pull this off. We had a very good discussion at our meeting at our work session on the 19th of July about this. And, and um, I understand that this is an insurance policy of sorts. And the place that I got, I was somewhat uncomfortable. I'm not a big fan of fences, but, um, but I'm, I'm persuaded that I'm okay with this, provided that, that we add a policy that says that um, the council is gonna make the decision about deploying this um, whenever that comes up, because I think it's up to our staff to do, to make the suggestions about the options for us, but it's up to us to make the decision about how much protection we need and when we need it. and so. So that's that's the one reason I wanted to raise it. I don't know if, if Chief, if you want to add anything, but um, it's that's that's all. I just wanted to raise it to make sure. And we don't have to do that now. We can do a policy mm -hmm. as we agree to move on with the joint powers agreement. So, Member Jackson. So just so I'm clear, we would have a policy as to when it would be put up and taken down as opposed to having to call us all and say, is it okay if we put it up? No. Yeah. I think so. No, the policy no. would be to okay. call okay. us all and say, is it oh, okay to put okay. it up? Oh, well, that's why I asked. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Great. I'm sorry. I wasn't very clear yeah. about that. But all right. Thank that you. Was, I mean, the discussion we had at the work session was, um, was just over, you know, who makes the call about these important kind of decisions. And you know, as I sit here, I can't imagine a situation where we need to use it, but that's also why we need to have it is because maybe there'll be things we can't imagine. And eight years ago, there were a lot of things that I couldn't imagine would happen in the next eight years that have already happened. So, so I'm, I'm, I understand the need to prepare and to be ready, but I also want to make sure that this council or future councils makes the call about whether to deploy that kind of measure. Manager Neal. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I know that, that Council Members Staunton and Anderson and the Mayor uh, were present during two, uh, 2020 when we were having regular um, emergency meetings of the Council, closed sessions of the Council. So we have some experience about how to do that, how to call you together quickly, uh, present uh, you know, a, a recommendation to the council and getting action on it. And that's, that's what we envision could happen here. I think the kinds of events that would cause us to uh, assess the threat level of, of rioters, not protesters, but people rioting and, and, and uh, kind of bent on destruction of this building or other buildings here, we, we have some pre you know pre advance notice that that might might happen right we we know an event happened and we can draw a logical conclusion that that's a risk and and maybe we even have intelligence that that's a risk and we would present that to you we'd hope that you would uh, acknowledge and endorse it and we'd be off to the you know off to the jp off to the jpa to with the fence request but member pierce uh, thank you mr mayor i i um I assume that that is just an operating principles that we would outline um, is maybe how I would say it. But um, I think we should, because of the conversation that we had, and I felt like we ended in a, a great spot, um, I think we should discuss that and just outline here is the process that we will use. Um, because the other question I asked, and I, don't think I saw that in the documentation is that it, it's a consortium and so the way we talked about it it felt like we were still petitioning to the consortium that we need fencing and there was still some uh, play in terms of how that decision gets made if other communities needed fencing as well because we're not buying we're not 
there's not going to be enough fencing for all the communities. And so just some of those uh, nuances, um, I think it, I would feel more comfortable if you know, we had that outline. This is how we would, uh, this is the agreement and how it gets, um, and how it gets executed. Um, and then add to that, these are the principles around how we as an Edina would decide when to deploy. Chief, do you have a comment on that? Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. Uh, first and foremost, I, I agree with the comments made here before us. I think it is good practice from a policy decision-making process and to get in front of our elected officials to have those very specific conversations if we should ever have an event like that. So I'm in agreement with that. And then I, I think I would offer that we would look at this as phase one as part of the planning. And so we're, we're simply saying that we're going to commit to this and get involved with the GPA. But there's a phase two to come after this, and when this uh, board is developed out, those are the exact issues that they're going to work through over the next several months, which is the definition of what an event would look like. Uh, hopefully, and we, we think this will happen, uh, to extend the length of the fencing and potentially get into a situation where they might buy the fencing, so that'll take care of those kinds of issues that could come forward down the road for us. So I, I believe that everything will get established over time, and I do believe it would be fairly easy for us to put some parameters around uh, some kind of a policy decision-making process or put that forward before this council. Your Honor. Manager Neal and then Member Anderson. I, I think in response to, to Council Member Pierce's um, questions and concerns the the what we're asking for is to be uh, is for your authorization to be at the table so that we can help form and answer some of those questions because some of those questions uh, are answered only by the JPA itself uh, and those are the logistical tactical questions about how much fence do we buy and who gets it if it's if there's more than two cities that need it and those sorts of questions if if we're at the table we can help shape that policy if we're not at the table if we can't commit to join the jpa they don't want us at the table that's what i would say um, the rest of it though about what triggers a dyna to ask for it that question is clearly decided at this in this room right um, and that's part of what uh, that's part of what i think uh, you're asking for tonight is for us to prepare some policy language that you would you would approve and that would that would uh, control how we how we submit a request to get this fence in the first place. And, and chief, you'd like to see us approve that resolution 2022-66 tonight, so that we could get to, you know we could become part of the JPA and then we can have this subsequent discussion internally about yeah. how we're going to handle it on the dining end. Mr. Mayor, I would. We are under a deadline, and we have to get this completed by September 1st. Okay. All right. Member Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a, a couple questions, Chief. Um, uh, in your, uh, we don't have access to this fencing, and I don't know where it's been used elsewhere. Um, do you have any idea of uh, if, if, as we develop a policy, What's the timeline, do you think, in terms of requesting fencing, having it in place and on site? Sure. So currently the situation that we're dealt with uh, is that there is not a vendor locally for us to call into uh, play. And so that uh, would take probably at least a day or two to get a fence solution in place if we should need it. What this JPA and this consortium would do for us is allow for a fencing solution to be uh, stored locally here in the metro area and provide that within hours should the call go in. I'm sorry, how many hours did you say? Two to three hours. Two to three. Yep. Okay. And so what you, I think in our last meeting, the work session, I think you stated basically <laughs> the, the human line, the blue line, is good for about two hours in the face of that type of event. That's correct. So um, officers that are holding a line in a situation like that, there are, there's limited capacity and time to establish that and to do that uh, for sustained periods of time. And so a fence solution is the optimal way to um, set up a safety uh, perimeter around any kind of a building or established or a government entity such as this. And uh, that is highly recommended based on experience that we've seen here locally. Thank you, that's very helpful. And so just in going forward as we discuss policy on that, then I, I think what we're gonna have to determine is what our timeline would be in terms of gathering and how we gauge that event. And, I, and that becomes important in the unlikely and hopefully never experienced situation where we might consider erecting that fencing. It, it's a calamitous type of event. We don't really like to consider it. It's a, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like to think that's gonna happen here. 
but as we buy this insurance policy, then we recognize the possibility that that can happen. And so if that were to occur, timing is going to be very important in that. So I just, I just encourage, as we consider policy, that we consider that timing and how we implement. Thank you. Thank you. Manager Neal, I think you made a, a good distinction here, the notion being that if we're facing a riot situation, that's one thing of its peaceful protesters uh, like we had, I believe it was October of 16 mm -hmm. in the council chambers and Member Staunton and I, was it 16 or 18? 16. 16. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that's a totally different situation and uh, appropriate for them to have their voice heard. So, uh, all right, Any, anything else that you wanted? You. Well, I think we've to covered add. everything well here tonight. Officer Kosky, anything you want to add? No, Mr. Mayor, thank you. All right, all right, thank you. Um, Member Staunton, do you want to move that matter? Sure, Mr. Mayor, I'll move um, item, is it 6 0? Correct. That's correct. Is there a second? Second. We had a motion and a second to adopt uh, 6 0. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting uh, resolution 2022 66, which is item 6 0 on our agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, that completes uh, matters on the consent agenda and the items removed therefrom. Uh, we've got one public hearing matter this evening, and that is the potential uh, suspension of a liquor license uh, involving a, a restaurant operation in our town called People's Organic. And I'm going to turn now to Sharon Allison, our city clerk. And we've got Lieutenant Dan Convoy with us this evening to um, answer any questions. But first, it's, uh, it's Clerk Allison's obligation on the way we do business to talk about this potential liquor license violation and potential suspension. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council members. Uh, compliance checks are done twice annually by our police department uh, to make sure that establishments are not selling uh, tobacco as well as alcohol to underage individuals. Most recently, um, in June, the compliance check was done and there were five violations. One tobacco um, by BP on Vernon and four alcohol, Buffalo Wild Wings, Lifetime and Wooden Hills. Those three um, establishments, it was their first offense. And so they had the right to waive an opportunity to attend a public hearing and pay the $500 fine, which they did. Um, for the next um, offender, People's Organic, this is their second violation in uh, 24 months. And so they are required to, um, we are required to hold a public hearing based on state statute. Um, the recommended penalty um, based on our ordinance is a three-day um, liquor license suspension as well as a $1,000 fine. Um, staff recommends that we that the council um, approve their suspension to be Monday through Wednesday, August 8th through the 10th, as well as the $1,000 fine. Lieutenant Convoy is here and um, is available to answer any questions that you may have regarding the compliance checks. And uh, People's Organics owner, uh, Jewel Roberts, is also in attendance and is um, more than willing to answer any questions that you may have um, for her. And with that, I will stand for any questions that you may have for me. All right. Questions for Clerk Allison or for Lieutenant Convoy? Lieutenant Convoy, did you have anything you wanted to add before we no, Mayor, go to the questions? Okay. Questions? I just, Member Staunton? I just noticed that we did get an email from the server. Is that part of the record this evening? I'm not sure I understand you when you said the server. Yeah. Well, the person who served the. Uh, yeah. the oh, I'm sorry. Person. I wasn't aware of that. I mm -hmm. can't oh. respond to that because okay. I'm not aware so, of that email. So maybe we should make it part of the record tonight, but I don't have a copy with me. I was, don't either. It was an email from the individual who did the serving who was explaining her mistake and that mm -hmm. she she was taking responsibility for having kind of messed up and 
just wanted us to know that it, she didn't think it was a lack of training. She thought it was a lack of her attention to detail at that time. So I believe Ms. Roberts is going to talk with you about the training, too, that okay. is um, given to the staff at People's Organics. Great. Thanks. All right. But for the server, I mean, they get charged as well, as I recall, with a, is it a gross misdemeanor? Yeah. Yes, the uh, server was issued a citation that evening for a gross misdemeanor for okay. serving underage. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions from council members? Uh, Mike, one of my questions, uh, Mr. Mayor, is um, have we ever seen anything like this before? Yes. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Can I guess I'd like to hear a little more context because it, it, based on the letter, it sounded like a, an error in math by the server, and, and I guess if I had some context as to other situations that we've seen, maybe just even one story where we've seen that before, I'd appreciate that. Well, I think uh, from a context standpoint, Lieutenant Conboy or, or Clerk Allison, you might tell about how we go about doing that at uh, those, uh, those checks, because it, my recollection is that we, we basically tell them we're coming. We tell them mm -hmm. a, a week or two or three in advance, we're coming to your facility with an underage person and we're gonna check to see if you're in compliance. Let, Lieutenant Conboy? Yes, Mayor, that's correct. Um, in this case, I, th I believe it was probably about 10 days, maybe even less prior that we sent out notification to every liquor establishment, um, including city liquor stores, restaurants, bars, uh, saying that we will be doing compliance checks and the process is we have two undercover uh, plain clothes officers that bring generally one of our police explorers who's underage and uh, they all for example they'll all go into a restaurant and either sit at a table or go up to the bar they'll have the explorer who's the underage decoy order a drink and then they kind of wait to see what happens if um, in this case I believe the the, uh, the underage decoy did provide an ID a, a real ID showing that he was underage and the server uh, kind of like you said, didn't do the math right or didn't read on top of it saying that the person was under 21. Um, so that's when the plainclothes officers identify themselves. Mostly um, the servers are catching that um, the decoys underage or some cases they don't even ask for ID. And in the same instance, our undercover officers will identify themselves and explain what's happening. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought my recollection was that uh, if you're under 21, your driver's license is a different color. Uh, it's possible. Um, I probably should be more up to date on the, the uh, driver's license, what they look like, but I haven't worked okay. patrol in quite a long time. But um, they will say yeah. that um, the person is under 21 on it. I won't make that assumption that in the, in the case of this matter, we'll hear what Ms. Roberts has to say. From people's organic. We're just drivers at home. Right. So. They're not a different color, but there's a large bar at the top that okay. clearly says under 21. Yeah, it's, you Correct. don't have to do math to do, yeah, to, that's to do what this. I, that was the point I was going to yeah. get to. Is you don't have to do math if someone's under 21. It's true. All right. Ms. Um, Roberts, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jewel Roberts. I'm the owner of People's Organic, uh, along with my husband. Um, so I was coming just to talk a little bit about, about training. I know Katie sent in a message. Um, we got your letter. Uh, we actually did uh, the full staff. We do training twice a year. Um, it was not even 30 days prior that we did a staff training on Cardine IDs, and we, it was a, a wine tasting slash Cardine IDs uh, meeting. So they had just been trained on it. Uh, we, you know, years ago we had gotten cited. Um, we've been around for going on 12 years here. Um, and since then, I've always taken a ton of precautions because I never wanted something like this to happen. Um, so at every register, we have three registers, and there is the um, little signs with the date and the year that you flip off. Um, and then we have the letter that you gave, which I posted on the board where everyone, you walk by it every day and you see it when you punch in. Um, and I text it out to everyone like, hey, they're coming, show them you can do it. You know everything so she she knew she knew they were coming um she called me crying when it happened she was think you know she was hysterical about it um and in her, what she said to me is that she looked at the 23 and for some reason you know she's thinking you're 22 and then she added it versus minusing 
Uh, so she said it was the air. However, and I didn't say this to her at the time because I was kind of putting salt on a wound because she was very upset about it, but it does say under 21. The IDs do. Um, so there is that. I, I don't think as a company we don't train them. Um, we very much do, and we do take it seriously. I, but she did make the mistake, um, and I, you know, that, that that's kind of where it is. But she did have all the tools they, I should, all of them have all the tools to do it right. Um, and we definitely, we have a, uh, we have some people who get annoyed with us because we have a card everyone policy. And so it just, it doesn't matter who it is. If you order your card, um, if you've ever dined with us before, during the day you order at the register and then you sit down. If someone is giving you the, your, your wine or beer at the table after you order, because we bring everything out, we card again. Because um, we got, actually, that was the one that we got years ago, was that someone brought it out and they stuck it in front of the wrong person, you know, the person, and, and so. But um, anyway, so we take it seriously. Uh, Katie just made a mistake. She's great otherwise, though. And it was the end of the night. She had, she, if you read the letter, it's kind of a long ramble, but as I am doing right now. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Oh. Uh, Clerk Allison, what are our options here with respect to the um, uh, potential three-day liquor license suspension and the and the uh, extent of the fine is it is it mandatory or do we have flexibility in um, that regard? well the state statute does uh, say that you can go up to 60 days or a two thousand dollar fine in our ordinance it is a presumptive penalty and the next phase is a three-day suspension okay that's right. We've got a we've got that presumptive penalty chart. We have a matrix. Right. Yeah. A matrix exactly. That we follow. Right. That we've had in place for several years. Yep. Right. Remember Jackson? Did that help at all, or are you still? <laughs> well, uh, I'm a big believer in human error. That we all make mistakes, and it it just seems I I don't know how to how to reconcile this. Um, it was a, a stupid mistake, and I've made stupid mistakes, and I don't know. I, I think it sounds like if we have evidence that, that there's training and everything. Um, and it seems like a pretty severe penalty for a stupid mistake. So I just, I, I'm not understanding with the presumptive penalty, if that means that it's not, it can't be altered. Um, I don't understand that standard. Andrew Neal? Well, it's a when we've had these happen before, council asked staff to put together the matrix of how can we apply a more uh, a more standard kind of set of penalties given certain circumstances. So that's where it came from. It came from council, and we apply it uh, to to violations such as this. And and there's 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 heavier penalties if there's future violations at the same license holder just like this one is heavier than the other three that yep. you identified tonight That's because right. this is the second in 24 months mm -hmm. and the, and the, actually the, the the more onerous uh criminal burden if you will falls on the server getting a gross misdemeanor and this is mild comparing to a gross misdemeanor on your record which is really a tragedy but you know that's an issue that the server is going to have to deal with, whether they hire counsel or not. I don't know. Well, that that helps me understand. Yeah. Um, I think it's, um, it's it's we don't like it. Yeah, either. yeah. You know, well, it, it helps just put it in context. Yeah. It is, yeah. And and as I can tell you from being involved in maybe a handful of these over the years, uh, the stories are quite similar. Okay. You know, somebody made a mistake, but we've always followed the matrix, that's why we put it together, to try to give people uh, an opportunity to cure themselves. And then you had this second offense within 24 months. And as Clerk Allison points out, we could be a lot more draconian, if you will, uh, we could be a lot more harsh under the state statute than we've chosen to be okay. by creating that matrix. So, well, and then I can see in the recommendation that uh, Kirk Allison and Lieutenant Conboy are making, they're trying to pick days of the week in sequence that maybe are lighter from a business standpoint to try to minimize the impact. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. yeah. it's a violation. Yeah. It helps to hear it yeah. in context. Okay. That, that. 
Ms. Roberts, I really want to add, thank you for coming in. If I may add, Mr. Yes. Mayor, to what uh, Councilmember Jackson is saying, so there is a third level, and then there is a, uh, so this is a first, second, third, and a fourth level. The fourth level is revoc revocation, and that's where the council does have some flexibility in taking a look at the business over the years, and you could decide if you should revoke the license or allow them to keep their license. But at this point, to make it fair for everyone, it's best to um, follow the matrix. Follow the matrix. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you get that uniform treatment of other people that have been right. similarly situated. Yeah. Yeah, but Ms. Roberts, thank you for coming in. Mm -hmm. It was good of you to do so. Yeah, of course. Um, so we've got a recommendation from our city clerk, and uh, Lieutenant Conboy was here for questions and to provide some detail around the. Uh, the activity of our underage person. Is there a motion to approve me people? Uh, oh, wait a minute. This is a public hearing. Yeah. Hold on. Thank you for testifying. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to testify regarding this matter? Director Benarat, do we have anybody online that's waiting to testify? I don't have anyone right now, but because it's it's been less than a minute since you actually called for testimony, I would wait for a minute before moving on, giving people time to call in, um, because there is a slight delay in the broadcast. My clock shows that it's 7.53, so I'll come back to it 7.54 or when I have a caller, whichever is first. Okay. I think it's safe for you to f move forward with your agenda. All right, thank you, Director Benarat. Um, is there a motion to close the public hearing matter with respect to the potential liquor license suspension, uh, People Organics liquor license? So moved. Second. We had a motion and second to close the public hearing with regard to this matter. Any further discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now we have in front of us a recommended motion from our staff. These are these are tough. Um, we don't like to see them either. When I see them on the agenda, I think, oh boy. And then you get a great operator like People's Organic that um, uh, everybody in our community loves so much from a restaurant standpoint and a kind of place to hang out and have a good meal and a cup of coffee. But nonetheless, uh, we face this difficult situation based on the facts involved. Is there a motion to approve People Organic's three-day liquor license suspension for the period, um, what was it, August? 8th through the 10th. 8th through the 10th. Uh, and uh, impose a $1,000 fine for their second liquor license violation within 24 months. So moved. Second. We get a motion by Member Staunton, second by Member Anderson uh, to um, approve the liquor license suspension for three days for People's Organic, the days would be the 8th through the 10th of August 2022, and impose a $1,000 fine for their second liquor license via, uh, violation within 24 months. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approval of the motion of stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Sorry. That concludes our public hearing portion of the agenda. Um, next is uh, under item 8A, resolution accepting donations. And as has been our practice, we've carved out one that's really quite um, distinct from some that we see from time to time. But the first matter is resolution 2022-71, 
which is a, I believe, a bench donation. Uh, is there a motion to adopt resolution 2022-71? So moved. Second. Got a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Pierce to adopt uh, resolution 2022-71, which would accept donations on behalf of the city of Edina. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of that resolution, 2022-71, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And and this is to the Park and Rec Department. Jerry Albrecht from our community, $3,200 for a bench at Centennial Lakes. I'm sure a memorial bench. So, Jerry Albrecht, thank you very much. Uh, and then we're going to go back to the next resolution, uh, which involves a potential donation uh, or accepting a donation. 2022-67 uh, would involve accepting a donation from one of our residents, uh, uh, Brigadier General Retired Dennis W. Schulstead, and I'm going to have, uh, you, you, do you want staff to come forward with, want everybody to come up, uh, Mr. General Schulstead, Tiffany, want to, want to come up to the, do you have a presentation, do you have anything that we can well, we can, we can See, tell you. See, as a premature, do you have Yeah, we certainly tell you about it. Uh, Tiffany Bushland, uh, uh, General Manager at Centennial Lakes Park, honored to be here tonight with uh, Dennis Schulstead, who is donating $25,000 for a bronze statue in honor of his late wife. Um, it'll be a beautiful statue and enhanced landscaping at Centennial Lakes Park that we're um, proud to accept and honored to accept. Um, anything that you'd like to say? Oh, I'm just Pam and our golden retriever walked around that lake on hundreds of occasions. It's, it's really a jewel for the city of Edina. And so I want to publicly thank uh, the mayor, Scott. We had a meeting to talk about how, what we can do to uh, remember Pam and to make Centennial Lakes even better. And then Tiffany came along with some terrific ideas. And so, uh, so it'll be a life-sized bronze statue of a golden retriever with his hand up uh, so kids can shake his hand and enjoy that marvelous facility at Centennial Lake. So thank you very much for your support. Well, thank you. Are you still thinking about that same location, Tiffany, yes. over uh, near the office park on that little outcropping? Yes, that's correct. So the, the statue will go um, in the south side of the park near the office park. It'll be um, kitty corner of the Circle of Fish artwork. So it'll be a great visual Very location good. for it. And uh, Denny was good enough uh, to send out uh, Nick Lagueros from our community, the sculptor, is working on the Golden Retriever. And uh, they sent a clay mock-up uh, picture for us to look at. And it's, when it's finished, it's going to be fantastic. So is there a motion to approve resolution 2022-67, accepting a donation from Dennis W. Schulstead of our community for a bronze statue commemorating his wife uh, and their golden retriever, and upgraded landscaping at Centennial Lakes Park uh, valued at $25,000? So moved. Second. We had a motion by Member Anderson, second by Member Jackson uh, to approve that resolution as stated. Any further Discussion, all those in favor of adoption of resolution 2022-67 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to something that we uh, started talking about at our prior meeting, and that is uh, the adoption of a potential interim ordinance uh, prohibiting the sale, testing, and manufacturing and distribution of THC products. We know there's been a lot of conversation around this uh, legalization of this product at the uh, state legislature. We've been advised by council that we could, on an interim basis, uh, have an ordinance that would prohibit the sale, testing, manufacturing, and distribution of THC products. Manager Neal and uh, our city attorney uh, David Kendall been working very diligently on this matter for us and for our community. So I'm going to turn now to Manager Neal and uh, Attorney Kendall. Manager Neal. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'll start the presentation. The, uh, as we discussed last time, uh, what we're asking you to do is to adopt an interim ordinance, a moratorium on the, on the retail sale um, of these products in the community. This gives us the opportunity to put together uh, to do some research and also then to prepare a regulatory uh, structure that includes 
the various uh, phases of how you regulate a new product like this uh, in the community. Um, we have already started that process. Uh, Mr. Kendall has been working on that ordinance. It's our plan to share the regulatory ordinance with you for a kind of a first run at the next meeting, at the next council meeting in August. The, the interim ordinance uh, moratorium is for 12 months. That's as long as, as you are uh, allowed by state statute to have an interim ordinance or a moratorium. Uh, you would have the chance to, to uh, eliminate that moratorium once, we, once you have a regulatory structure in place that you have confidence in. All right, good. Questions for Manager Neal? I know we've been, we've been visiting about this for some time. Member Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, question on, um, we talked about this, I think, the last time as well. In fact, I think Member Staunton asked uh, or made the point that uh, moratoriums, they typically don't go 12 months. Um, and so can you speak to, um, can you speak to that regarding this in terms of the work that you're already doing and how quickly we think that we could um, come to some resolution there? Yeah, and Council Member Pierce, members of Council, yes, I can speak to that. Uh, we had a meeting uh, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday morning, uh, with Mr. Kendall and a number of our uh, regulatory staff that would be involved. So the police department, community health, uh, city clerk, we to to just discuss how how we could put this together. We will be using the the city's existing tobacco control ordinance as as the model uh, to do this. Uh, as I said, we're going to present the first. Uh, draft of that ordinance to you at the August 16th council meeting. Uh, let's say it has two uh, readings. If it if it goes through uh, council review at kind of the fastest pace, you know this could be you could be considering the elimination of the moratorium in October. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, one of the the um, other reasons I asked that question. Um, I did have a conversation with a uh, resident. Um, and I have been clear that um, we don't expect this to be 12 months. We've also done some research that uh, shows that we don't currently have vendors in the city that are selling um, these products. Um, and so this one conversation I had, the resident did make the point that they are using these products. Mm -hmm. Um, and they go to Richfield or other communities, um, or they're ordering online. Um, and so I do think um, we don't want to stand in the way of other businesses, potentially in Edina, um, deciding to provide this benefit to our residents. Um, and so as, as we can, uh, as expeditiously as possible, get through the process so that we have a good regulatory process in place to protect residents as well. Um, I would uh, advocate for that. Thank you. Hmm? Yeah, thanks for that question and, uh, and those comments. Member Jackson. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a comment. Um, Please. So my concern was when this first came out, um, it was a pretty, the information about it was all about, as you guys spoke about it at the last meeting, making something that's in a gray area much safer. And, and that's a really important thing. Um, my concern was that there was no criminal penalty for underage sales. And the first materials that came out on this didn't address it. it the enforcement didn't talk about that. Since then, the League of Minnesota Cities has come out saying that in the chapter that this is a part of, there is a criminal penalty for violations. And that was really important to me. Um, I didn't want to criminalize something that had been decriminalized by the state, but there's a criminal penalty for sales um, for under 21. So that was my primary concern, because we do want to make sure that this is done safely. And so I, I echo Member Pierce's comments. We want to see this happen fairly quickly, um, but we want to make sure that our, our, our minors in Edina are safe. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I want to encourage the state to put a tax on this as well, just like tobacco and alcohol. So thank you. Can we impose a local tax? <laughs> I don't know. We haven't talked about that. We haven't, we haven't talked about idea. that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can do that. Either. 
<laughs> I can look into that if you like, but I don't think so. Yeah. All right. Well, there was a good idea dashed quickly. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, any other uh, questions from council members? Comment from Manager Neal? No, no, nothing or, more uh, from Attorney me. Kendall? You, you feel comfortable that we can do this? And otherwise, you wouldn't have gone to the work you did, I'm sure. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I, I feel comfortable. And also, um, we're well underway trying to draft a, a licensing ordinance. And so we'll get that back to you as soon as possible if that's what you're looking for next. All right. Thank you. Sir, a motion to approve ordinance number 2022-06, which is an interim ordinance prohibiting the sale, testing, manufacturing, and distribution of THC products and waive second reading. Is that so what moved. you prefer? Yeah. No, this is the second reading. This is the second reading. This is the second, this is the second reading. reading? Okay. And grant second reading. I guess that's more appropriate then. All right. Very good. Um, we got a motion by Member Staunton, second by Member second. Pierce. Thank you. And any further discussion? All those in favor of the adoption of the motion 2022-06 as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then, of course, we've got to publish this. And uh, Clerk Allison, do you want to comment about, about the uh, summary publication of this matter? Just briefly, Mr. Mayor, um, state statute allows us to publish a summary um, of a lengthy ordinance, and this ordinance would fit into that category, um, and you are required to approve the summary publication. All right, very good. Any questions for Clerk Allison? Is there a motion to approve the summary publication for ordinance number 2022-06, which was an interim ordinance, of course, that you just approved, prohibiting the sale, testing, manufacturing, and distribution of THC products? So moved. Second. Member Jackson moves. Member Anderson seconds. The motion is stated. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the adoption of the motion to approve the summary publication for Ordinance 2022-06 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now we're going to uh, talk about a bond sale that's taken place. I'm going to turn to Manager Neal, and we've got uh, Nick Anhut, our Senior Municipal Advisor from Ellers, with us. And then we've got Alicia McAndrews, our Finance Director, available virtually. But I'm going to turn to Manager Neal, and then uh, I'm sure we're all waiting to hear what Mr. Anhut has to say about who bid on our bonds and what was the rate. Who is the lucky winner? All right, that's what we want to know. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, members of council. Uh, this item is in front of you tonight uh, because it is part of a, a city initiative to build a new fire station, fire station number two. Uh, we had previously, uh, staff had previously recommended to the city council uh, this particular site uh, at uh, 4404 West 76th Street, I believe. Uh, we had negotiated a uh, initial purchase agreement to acquire the site. Uh, what's in front of you tonight is a bond sale that will finance not only the sale, um, the purchase of that property, but also the uh, the clearance of that property and the initial design work on the on the fire station. And with that, I can turn it over to Mr. Anhut. All right, Mr. Anhut, welcome. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, Manager Neal, uh, Nick Anhut with Ellers and Associates, financial advisors to the city of Edina, and I'm. Happy to present some favorable results that we received on your behalf this morning. So as Manager Neal mentioned, uh, there was a public hearing that was held back in June by this body that uh, preliminarily approved up to $39 million worth of financing to uh, fund this project. Uh, this proposed bond issue here is interim financing to acquire the site and initiate the initial design of that project with the intention that permanent financing of that 39 million will occur over the course of the next uh, two to two and a half years as those details unfold. Uh, so this issue will mature in the year 2025. There is capitalized interest included to cover interim payments. So there is no need to adjust levies or any budgetary impacts during this interim period. And then we intend to wrap uh, this amount into permanent financing at some point once we get a clearer picture of the overall cost and budget for the project. I'm happy to say, even though we did initiate these discussions with the last bond issue at the city, uh, both Moody's and s &P did check in with the city staff, uh, hold some discussions, and your bond rating, your AAA bond rating, was affirmed by both of these entities. 
placing the city among the top of the echelon of all thousands of municipal city, county, and school districts across the country. Um, you've held these ratings for, in some cases, more than 20 years, and uh, these agencies did not see that this financing or any of the future capital plans that we uh, did share in those discussions placed that rating in jeopardy. And with that, that bond rating at the highest point, it does allow the city to borrow at a very low rate. And so we did receive five bids on behalf of the city this morning, with the winning bid coming from Morgan Stanley out of uh, their New York office at an indicated interest cost of 2.129%. So that is the applicable interest rate for the borrowing and the associated financing costs associated with uh, this $17 million of borrowing. Uh, we received bids from Citigroup, Baird, Piper Sandler, and Northland Securities, all the way up to just a hair under 2.7%. Um, so over half a percentage point difference between the uh, various bidders, with an interest difference among them of $234,000 from the low to high. Um, as you can see, Morgan Stanley's bid was very favorable in comparison to the others that were presented. And uh, we, we certainly recommend that you move mm -hmm. forward and accept this uh, very opportune proposal. With the adoption of the resolution this evening, the council would uh, provide final authorization for $17 million. Uh, those funds will be deposited in the city council to pay costs of issuance, uh, capitalize interest over the course of the next two and a half years, and then also facilitate the site acquisition for the new project, as well as some of the initial design work uh, at a calculated true interest cost of 2.129% over the entire period. So I will, I will turn it back for any questions of the council, but we certainly do recommend that you move forward, uh, adopt this resolution, which would award the sale of bonds to Morgan Stanley, uh, reflecting the terms of the lowest proposal that was received and a competitive sale this morning on behalf of the city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Anhut. Uh, questions for Mr. Anhut? Comments from council members? Member Pierce. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I, my, this, thanks for the presentation, great result. Um, but I do want to try to learn something here. So, <laughs> so why the spread? This is the, the, the second time I can remember when there was that kind of spread from the lowest to the highest. Um, and I'm just curious, like what, what would drive that? Is there anything we can learn in that? Um, or is there additional leverage or what have you? So if you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Pierce. Uh, you know, there's a variety of different factors each uh, underwriter or investment broker is going to have their own audience that they're trying to appease or their own uh, clientele that are going to be pooling the funds to invest in these bonds. Um, I will say I was surprised a little bit by the magnitude from low to high, not so much the difference on in the interim. Um, but this is a single maturity of $17 million that is, that is maturing in 2025. So it's a little bit different from some of the other financing that we've seen in the past with the city where we tend to spread out those payments over a longer duration. So we would expect to see more volatility, less of an audience, uh, if you will, for this type of a transaction. Uh, I will also say that with the Fed taking action last week, you know, even though that was a planned and uh, premeditated action to boost interest rates again to combat inflation, um, we have seen uh, that has created a little bit of volatility as well. And there are some other uh, larger offerings that are coming into the marketplace over the course of the next month. So there are some other um, bonds that um, uh, brokers will be lining up for as well. So I, I think we still got a very favorable result from the winner, um, but maybe not a consensus amongst the, the group that this was where they wanted to put their $17 million right now. Um, but I don't know that I would say that there's any lessons we learned for future actions. And this is certainly not a financing that the city intends to do on a routine basis. Sure. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Anhut. Uh, always, you, you, but generally the bearer of very good news, <laughs> which is what you want to be with the city council, I think. Thank you. <laughs> um, so is there, is there a uh, motion to approve resolution 2022-70, which would award the sale of, of uh, $17 dollars worth of general obligation temporary CIP bonds series 2022B to Morgan Stanley and Company LLC. So, so moved. Move. Second. Uh, so moved by Member Pierce, second by Member Jackson. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of approving resolution 2022-70 which would award the sale of 17 million dollars in the type of bonds described to Morgan Stanley and Company LLC say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right, thank you for being here. This is an unusual one in that terms of the short duration of the borrowing. It's the first time I think I've seen that, but it was quite, quite a good rate for um, a three-year proposition, really. Um, okay, and now we're gonna go to, we've got a couple of our planning commissioners with us this evening. Our chair uh, of the planning commission, Kay Agnew is here and uh, uh, one of the, her colleagues and uh, longtime planning commissioner Lou Miranda are here to tell us about the off street parking regulation recommendations that are coming from the planning commission. And of course, this is something the council has wrestled with for quite a time. And we keep pushing the responsibility off on the, on the members of the planning commission and say, okay, look at it again and look at it again. And here, here we are finally now live and we get to have a nice conversation with both of you. And so, First of all, I'll say, I'll say thanks for, uh, to both of you and, and uh, on behalf of all your colleagues uh, too, uh, you know, thanks from the council to all of us, to all of you for this, this good work that you do, not only in this matter, but on, on all of the things land use related for the city of Edina. Thanks. All right, uh, go ahead, uh, Chair. Yes, Mayor, members of the council, thank you so much for having us tonight. So this, this conversation has been going on for a while between Planning Commission and the City Council on parking in Edina. And so we first presented, I think it was last July, this ordinance for review, and the discussion that came from that was wanting to really understand how this particular ordinance plays into the bigger picture of how we see parking, parking requirements, and just the evolution of parking in Edina. So what we did is we, we took a couple of steps back and we wanted to frame up what's our goal. Why are we talking about parking? Why does parking continue to come up? And then root in our, our strategy and, and kind of our game plan towards that. Um, so we're gonna walk through what that plan is, how this ordinance fits into that plan, and then um, Director Teague will um, go through the ordinance in more detail. Um, so I definitely wanna have a conversation kind of at that high level of, of what we're thinking from the Planning Commission about parking, but then also obviously here to discuss the ordinance in and of itself. So with that, um, so when we were thinking about our high level goals, um, the first was, was really sustainability. Um, the use of vehicles um, requiring a, a lot of space being dedicated to vehicles obviously has an impact on sustainability. So we were looking at our climate action plan. Um, and I know that there is a report from the city as well of, of you know, referring back to the climate action plan actually calling for the elimination of parking minimums. But I think it's really about that tie to sustainability that parking really has. Reducing vehicle miles traveled, increasing transit. Um, so really, really leaning forward with sustainability as a, a first goal. Next it was out about equity and affordability of housing. Um, so. Costly parking mandates are something that really drive up the, the costs of housing. And so we looked at, you know, are there ways that we can decouple parking from housing to really strive for equity in the housing options that we have and making sure that we're, we're really meeting the diverse needs of members of our community. Next, we also talked about our local economy. So we, we really desire walkable community nodes that have you know, retail, fine dining, community establishments that are, are bringing people to our community and, and really creating those areas of, you know, I think of a lot of like 40th, 4th and France, right? 
what, how can we continue to draw people that live in that area into that node and create really walkable communities? Uh, and then lastly, we talked a lot about children and kind of, you know, what do we want Edina to become and what is the role of, of parking and in traffic in the safety of children? Um, and the one note that I'll, I'll kind of bullet point here is, is reducing congestion. Um, so when you think about areas where, where parking is, it's sometimes even harder to find, right? And so I'm, I'm really thinking here of the phrase right-sizing parking. When you have areas where people don't know where to park or parking is hard to find, what happens is you have a lot of cruising. Cruising is, you know, looking around, going around the block three or four times. And so there are a lot of studies that show that the more cruising you have, um, the more traffic you have on some of these side streets. And so really what we, we think about is right-sizing parking. Um, and it, it's not so much um, always necessarily like eliminating parking, right? It's about what do, what do the areas need and how are we meeting what the needs are? So, um, really that strategy is thinking about how can we tell that story? Um, reducing costly parking mandates doesn't necessarily mean reducing parking, reducing options. It, it's really about finding that right sizing. Um, we also want to help tie this overall strategy of, of what parking will continue down the evolution to be to this bigger picture, right? So rooting in the, the comprehensive plan, our climate action plan, all of these plans that we have as a city and how these strategies tie together. Uh, we also have multiple steps, which um, Commissioner Miranda will, will go through in greater detail. And then we really wanna communicate what are the benefits. Um, and I know in, when we had our work, work session a couple of months ago, we talked about the idea of potentially like a, a parking benefit district and what that would mean. And I think that there are a lot of really appealing nodes where if we were to, you know, really figure out what's that right size and how could we create a, a benefit district, there are really ways to use parking as a lever to help bring other things into a specific node that we need, we need to fund different things like that. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Commissioner Marika. Thank you. Um, so what do we expect? I mean, now that we talked about the strategy for what we want to do for parking, um, what are the expected results of, of studying parking? So um, the first one is collaboration. Um, parking obviously is a land use problem because it physically takes up space within the city and it involves zoning. Um, but also parking involves cars and that involves transportation. So the collaboration between the planning and transportation commissions, having them work together, um, it would be kind of necessary in order to, to really fully study parking. Um, and then what are the results it would be plans? And so what we have here is just the beginning, right? And so this is, we're talking about off street parking ordinances um, simply because that's what the city council asked us to do. Um, but there are other ways of studying parking, including on-street parking management plan, which um, if you do change parking, that's something that, that uh, consultants recommend you, you look at. Um, and then looking kind of at a standing back and taking a big picture look at transportation of all kinds within the city. So having a citywide transportation plan. Um, we already have a bike and pedestrian plan, um, but do we need to talk more about um, transit and cars uh, as part of the transportation within the city? Um, and then finally, in terms of results, I mean, we want to continue Adina being a leader within the community, right? So Adina uh, is an innovator. We do a lot of things that um, other cities don't do or we're the first to do them. And so um, having a, you know, a leading uh, parking plan is something that we want to have in our city. All right, so um, here we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> the chair talked about uh, having a, uh, multiple plans, and, and here what we're talking about, it looks kind of complex, but it's basically a, a phased rollout of what parking, how parking might change over the years. So we're not gonna just have a one time, you know, change the parking and see how it works. Um, so left to right, we have columns that says short term, medium term, long term. So how are we gonna uh, roll this out? And then with each, within each one, we have different levels of scales of change. And so we could have a, you know, a lot of change would be high, medium amount of change, or a low amount of change. So it depends how much risk the city wants to take in terms of changing things too quickly or seeing how uh, climate change changes, for example. So for example, um, 
if the city wanted to be very aggressive, then the short-term goal might be, you know, remove all parking minimums. Uh, Medium-term goal would be having caps or maximums on parking, which we haven't really talked about yet. And then long-term would be something along the lines of transformative change, which the IPCC um, reports are increasingly calling for, that incremental change just isn't enough anymore. Um, if the city wanted to take a medium level of, of aggressiveness in terms of parking, um, a short-term goal might be re reducing, reducing rather than removing parking minimums. Uh, a medium-term goal would be removing parking minimums and adding parking benefit districts. Uh, and a long-term goal could be city a citywide transportation plan and then instituting maximums. Um, a low-risk uh, uh, plan would be a short-term having reducing some of the minimums, medium-term reducing all of the minimums, and then long-term would be a parking benefit district. Now, none of these are, are, are cast in stone or anything. These are just examples of what the city could do. And the city might even start with, with uh, you know, a low risk one for the short term and then find out that it's not enough and might go to a medium or, or higher risk one for um, the medium or long term. So this isn't meant to be prescriptive. It's just an example of things the city could do that it's not just a simple you know, one time thing that this is multiple levels of, uh, of uh, planning that we need to do. So with that, I will hand it over to Commissioner, or Director Teague. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mayor and members of the council, and thank you for recognizing the Planning Commission and all the hard work they do. They do a fantastic job and they put a lot of time in. Just like with this ordinance, we've put a lot of time in this as well. Also want to recognize Commissioner, former Planning Commissioner Ian Nemiroff, who, uh, former chair of the commission, put a lot of time and effort into this as well. So just want to start out by saying this ordinance hasn't changed. This is the same ordinance that was presented to the council last summer. Um, our existing ordinance dates back to 1970. So it's in, in great need of, of some updating. As mentioned um, by the commissioners, this is kind of the first step in considering um, parking as a much, as a much uh, a bigger, bigger plan uh, for the city for both off-street parking, um, parking on street, district parking, all, all the things that they talked about. Again, some of the things that, that went into this ordinance, we looked at national trends, um, usage of existing uh, parking lots in the city, um, mass transit, future, ex what's existing out there today, um, the desire to gain additional green space. So highlights of the ordinance include um, well, primarily reducing the amount of parking that's required for uses within the city. Um, it also, the ordinance also regulates a little bit differently depending on the node, um, which was requested by the, by the city council, regulating differently for the different, um, you know, 50th in France area, 44th in France, et cetera. Um, we've provided some incentives in the ordinance for shared parking, and we have added maximums. We had a little bit of discussion about maximums at the last work session. I would imagine that would be a, a discussion point. So this, uh, this graphic on the screen highlights the current ordinance on the left and the proposed ordinance on the right. In the middle is the ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Standards. A lot of the recent projects that the city has approved over the last few years required variances. And we've always done parking studies to justify those variances. And really the, the, the tool that's been used by our consultants is that Institute of Transportation Engineers. So just to highlight some of the, <clears throat> the more, um, the land uses that we see uh, most often. So apartments, the current ordinance requires two spaces per unit. The proposed ordinance would reduce that down to 1.25 spaces um, <clears throat> per unit with a maximum of 1.75. The ITE standard is 1.3 units, um, spaces per unit for a mid-rise and one space for a high-rise. 
For a medical office, current ordinance is one space per 200 square feet. Proposed ordinance is one, one space per 300 square feet. The ITE standard is one uh, space per 375. Uh, restaurants, um, a lot of this ordinance started with that restaurant that was proposed up in the 44th and France district. The current ordinance regulates one space per three seats plus the, the number of employees on a maximum shift. The ordinance that we're proposing here is a shift in not regulating by seats, <clears throat> but rather by square footage. It's difficult for staff to enforce number of seats in a restaurant, but very easy to regulate square footage. So the proposal is one, one space per 100 square feet. The ITE standard is one space per 81 square feet. Um, and I'll have a graphic that shows how those two compare to that restaurant that we looked at at 4,500. Uh, office space increases from um, current regulation of one space per 200 square feet to one space per 300 with a max of one space per 200 square feet. Uh, so the, the, the last few here are within our, our nodes. So in the mixed use district, we're suggesting 1.75 spaces per unit currently and a reduction to one space per unit with a maximum of 1.5. Um, uses within a, a, com a planned commercial district office, one space per 200 square feet, reducing that to one space per 350, again with a maximum of one, uh, of, uh, one space per 200 square feet. A uh, Shopping center, so Southdale. Currently the regulation is one space per 200 square feet. We're suggesting that be reduced to one space per 300 square feet. And again, that ITE standard is one space per uh, 340, 43 square feet. Uh, <clears throat> this, these next couple of slides provide um, exist, or recent projects that the city has approved. I won't go through in detail each one other than to say the proposed ordinance, with the proposed ordinance, all of these projects would meet the proposed ordinance. So they wouldn't have required variances. Each one of these projects did require a variance. Um, and again, we, the justification that we used primarily is that ITE manual um, based on the, the consultant report. Just want to expand here on the restaurant. So that restaurant that was proposed at 4,500 uh, France, it was a 100 seat restaurant. Based on that current ordinance, 43 spaces were required. Under the proposed ordinance, 42 spaces would be required. And that's using some of those reduction incentives that are in the ordinance. So that project didn't meet the ordinance at that time, and it wouldn't meet the ordinance as proposed. The other projects that we looked at here were the 70th in France project, the furniture store at 69th in France, uh, Amundsen Flats, the Aon housing project, Hazelden Apartments, or the Bauer, uh, the 7200, 7250 project, and the Avenue on France. So again, the proposed ordinance. Um, no variance would be needed for each of those. So options um, in front of the council this evening, you could grant first reading of the ordinance subject to any recommended changes you may have. You could approve the ordinance and waive second reading if you're comfortable with the ordinance as written. And of course there's a third option of taking no action and we stay with the ordinance that we have. I just want to note that also the city council held a public hearing last summer. There was a lot of feedback on better together um, those comments were provided in your packet. There was also an engineering um, memo that was provided by Andrew Scipioni and Grace Hancock in regard to reviewing the ordinance from a sustainability uh, perspective. And they've recommended some changes that, that staff would support. And they're, they're centered around section three that talks about the potential reductions in regard to transit, car sharing, environmental sustainability, and bike parking. And some of the suggestions are pretty simple, just adding language um, to clarify posting bus routes, those types of things. And again, it's included in their memo. Um, 
so staff would be comfortable if, if the council is comfortable with uh, making those changes and coming back at a second reading. With that, I will stop there and we can all answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, good, thank you. Thorough presentation, um, Member Staunton. So um, going back to Commissioner Miranda's chart, um, what, where are we on the chart with this proposal? I think he had that. I think there was one more, one more slide that showed where we are. What happened to it? Let's do this. Ah, yeah, right. Ah, oh, there it there is. Okay. <laughs> This or got the last. Uh, yeah, so we're in, we're in the short term, and it's. Um, so this is about the least aggressive, shortest term option. Yeah, I think really this is the reaction that we had is bringing the ordinance to where we're at right now. Um, so this hasn't really been touched. I would say there were a couple of adjustments made in the early 90s, but prior to that, this is an ordinance that was written in the 1970s. And so the adjustments, really showing you know the comparison to what ITE is bringing us in line with, with where we're at right now, and I think that's also evident given the, um, the variances and how uh, various proposals would have fallen in line with that. Um, the reason that we like to call that out is this is bringing us in line to where, where we're at right now, but is, if we as a city want to be more aggressive, be, be more forward thinking and leaning with that sustainability in mind, we should be taking more aggressive action towards reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the beginning, not the end. Correct. I mean, in my in an ideal world, right? I think we continue with this as that first starting point, and then the planning commission would love to include in our 2023 work plan, continuing to look at parking in, as a whole, rather than just through our off street uh, parking ordinances. Uh, potentially coming up with a, a working group or something like that to really pull together all of these phases with timelines. Right? There's no timelines here other than low, medium, and, and long, but really come up with that comprehensive strategy that drives us towards all of those goals that I started out with of, of sustainability, of, of driving you know safety in our, our community nodes and things like that. Um, and then can you talk to me a little bit about parking benefit districts and what you mean by those? Yeah, so the idea of a, a parking benefit district, and I, I always think it's helpful to root in our, our community here. So we think of an area like 44th in France. I'll use that as an example, because I know extensive studies have been done, and I would probably look to Director Teague if, if more questions about that study are, are uh, presented. But there was a study done of, of what is all of the parking within 44th in France, and the assessment was, it's not really under parked. There's not a, a lack of parking. It's just hard to find. Wayfinding's hard. You don't know where to park. It's it's just not as navigable. And so when we think about you know the mechanism of on street parking, that's usually where people you look on the street, and if it's not the street, you might drive around a couple of times. You don't always know where to go. A parking benefit district could could be an idea of placing um, parking meters, probably something very technical, technology advanced, but parking meters along the street that would price parking such that there's always one or two open places on the street. The benefit of that, and this goes back to the right sizing of parking, the benefit of always having one or two open spaces means that you are reducing the cruising that's happening within that neighborhood. Um, but then when you think about adding in parking meters, um, the result of that is well, what, what happens with that money? How can we use that money to really improve that area? So if, if we receive um, certain funding, we could invest that into improving sidewalks or improving wayfinding for other parking options. Um, really looking at how can we keep the, the funding, that the revenue that is gained from that within that local community to keep driving up um, kind of the options for pedestrians and, and overall public safety. So one potential use of that funding would be to build the district parking. 
that could be one option. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's where we'd really like to look at who are we pulling together in this working group and then what does that community need? And I think that there are a lot of really great examples of other cities that have enacted these parking benefit districts um, to look at what's worked well, what hasn't worked well. Um, but I think in that area in particular, we'd really want to evaluate is more parking at that node, what what in particular is needed? Sure. I don't know. Yeah, if I may contribute. Um, so in terms of that parking study, that was done for the 44th and France small area plan, which I was a, a part of. And what that study found, in fact, was that there's, there's plenty of parking, but it's not necessarily available to everyone at all times because it's privately owned. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the space is privately owned. And so um, having, as you described, a, you know, a, a shared parking area, that would allow um, less space to be dedicated to parking and more to other uses if the space is shared. So that's where that was going. Thanks. And I know I'm getting a little far afield here, but but the publicly accessible parking, the on-street parking, is free, but it's not really free, right? I mean, because we all pay for it. It's just that people who decide not to use it have to pay for it anyway because they're paying taxes and other things that take care of the streets and pay for it, whereas if we require people to pay for it, then those who didn't need to use it wouldn't have to pay for it, and we could generate revenue to provide solutions that would be district-wide. Right, and that's partly an equity issue too, right? So anyone who decides to, to bike or walk to the neighborhood because they live nearby, um, why, why should they have to pay you right. know, higher prices for products because the rent is higher, because the taxes are higher? You know, um, that's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the notion of maximums? So I get the minimums, but, and, I'm, and as I've watched over the years, watched the development community, I recognize that they have an incentive to make sure they have enough because if they don't have enough, then they're not going to be able to lease their space or they're not going to get tenants or they're not going to be able to sell their building. Why do we need maximums? Um, so in, in, in um, this ordinance, the, um, as the phases showed, you know, this is, this is a low... Um, scale of change thing. So the maximums, it's not maximums everywhere. It's, it's pretty limited in terms of what the maximums are. So we were trying to go for something that, um, you know, would be the start of, of a discussion about maximums and, and where they would be uh, useful. But it's, it's, it's not like, uh, I, I don't have the exact ordinance here, but... Um, yeah, it's only on, I, I recognize it's only on a few things. I'm yeah. just looking at the theory behind why I mean, are we really worried that people are going to create too much off-street parking on their site? I think when we began talking about maximums was when the, the Southdale Office Center uh, project was proposed, where they had the three parking ramps. Um, and in that project, they, they had provided about 700 parking spaces over what the city code required. Now, some of that was going to go toward district parking. But I think that where we began talking about that was we thought that development had too much parking in it and that if we establish some maximums, um, we could avoid that situation. Are there other ways for us to, um, during the land use review process, say no to too much parking? I suppose Without if it was maximums. a PUD, we could. but We could as part of a but PUD. But if it were just right. otherwise, they could... So long as they met the bulk standards and the use standards, then they could put in as much parking as they wanted. That's right. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, Member Jackson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I've got this chart, uh, Mr. Teague, Director Teague, that you put together. And I, I want to disagree with or saying this is low because it looks like you've reduced the minimums in every category in your chart, office, medical office, retail, shopping center, restaurants, apartments, and senior apartments are all lower, except I guess senior apartments isn't lowered, um, but the others all look like they've been lowered from the current ordinance. I'm looking at the Dyna 224 draft. Um, is, that, is that accurate? 
Yes, yeah, in, okay. in general, we are lowering the park parking requirements almost all across all uses, with the exception of restaurants, that's generally the same. I think, I think restaurants is also, it's going from, it, well, the number, the way it's calculated is changing. Yep. Um, and then the, I see two maximums for offices and for apartments. So I think we're actually on the medium as opposed to low, low, low change. So um, we've got both maximums put in and we've pretty much changed all, where we would be changing all the minimums. Correct. I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Um, and, and I want to thank you guys for this hard work. This has been a long time coming. And I remember when Chair Nemiroff, thank you for reminding us that when he brought that up, like, yes, finally. So I know it, it's been hard and, and it's very complicated. Um, so I, I do have some more questions. Um, one of the questions I had um, was, do we need any additional powers to create a parking benefit district? It sounds like maybe it's just a matter of putting meters in, or is there anything else to that that, um, th that we would need to have different powers in order to do? That's a great question and something that I would love us to explore more okay. as we pick up more and more of these recommendations for an entire comprehensive parking recommendation. Um, but at this point, I don't know um, what that would take, how we would do it, or all of the logistics, and I think a lot of research would need to be done. Okay, great. I just would point out that with a lot of the environmental things, we look at what St. Louis Park is doing, but they're a charter city and we're a statutory city, so there are some limitations, and that always is the first thing that jumps to mind, but thank you. Um, um, the second question I have for you, I think, goes to the 6800 France and, and Member Staunton did that, that that could have been a situation where we wanted to lower the number of parking and this would give us the tools now to do that. Um, that would be, we would project to the development community what our expectations are so we wouldn't have to surprise them. Um, uh, and then with a maximum for apartment buildings, I guess what I'm thinking about is I, the sense that will this have enough space for um, apartments where there are roommates? Because we can understand maybe in a family, one car, um, you know, and they can commute together. But when you've got roommates coming together and some of these high cost apartments that are getting built, will, do we have any sense for the market for how many cars are needed when, when we've got roommates moving in? Yeah, it, it's difficult to predict if we were to, you know, the mechanism to go over the maximums would be then a variance, okay. you know, where they could prove to the city that they need the, that extra space so we okay. could approve or deny based on, based on whatever the facts are that they present okay. to us. Okay, and, and then one last question. This is for you, Director Teague. You and I have had a conversation um, offline about spillover traffic. I know that was a lot of concern in the public hearing and in the Better Together comments. Um, what is your sense of as to whether this would create spillover traffic into neighborhoods, and especially with apartments? Are people going to need to park on streets if there's insufficient parking? What, what is your sense of that? Yeah, the, I feel pretty good that this ordinance won't cause that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when we look at the projects that we've approved um, in the ITE um, recommendations, yeah, I was very mindful just because after going through that variance process it, at 4,500 France, that was the big issue was yeah. that spilling out into the street. So that was kind of a, one of the priorities for me as we were shaping this, that we're not quite ready for that. It's, I think it's going to be part of a discussion moving forward, but I don't think this ordinance is going to cause parking out into the streets. Okay, terrific. Um, and then one last question for our, our planning commission members. Have you had a chance to read the memo from um, Andrew Scipioni and Grace Hancock, and are you comfortable with the suggestions that they made? I am, yes. yes. Yep, okay, absolutely. terrific. Well, again, this is a massive undertaking, and I know it's a it's a front door issue, as the mayor likes to say, that when when this really impacts people, the way people live in the city. So it's, it is contentious, and you've, you've done a very nice job and a thorough job. So thank you so much. Thank you, Member Jackson. Member Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so first off, I uh, applaud the work that you've gone through. Um, I, think it's, I think it's very thorough, um, and I do appreciate all the effort that goes into it. Um, so just a couple of comments. Um, can you put the, I'll call it the Staunton slide back up. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I, um, so I, you know, I support this ordinance, um, but I want to tell you why. Because it's not because of what you have in it. It's because of all the other things that you've said. Um, and so what I mean by that is it is, it's a, it is smart to say what we have been looking at was built, written in the 70s, so we need to normalize it for what we do today before we figure out how aggressive we need to be to get to the future. And so I just think that that is a, a very pragmatic approach. Um, I liked the, um, when you talk about, and you talked a lot about goals and targets, right? Those, to me, those are the right things that we should be talking about. And so the philosophy of saying we have an outdated ordinance that we're going to normalize for what we do today and we're going to continue to look at it and understand what goals we're going to establish and tweak this as we move forward. That just, like, that resonates with me because so many things are shifting. And so I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, I love that approach. On this slide, I actually interpreted this um, perhaps incorrectly, but I interpreted this as a philosophy change. And so while we made a lot of changes that are on the chart, we actually are, are really applying the same philosophy as before. So we've really only shifted, um, we shifted some numbers around, and then we did a little bit of, we're gonna now do square footage versus the number of spaces. Um, but it really is applying the same philosophy that we've had in the past, but we are normalizing it for how we use parking today. Um, and so I, I think to be more aggressive, things like parking benefit districts, I, the last time we talked about this, I, I love that idea. I'm not sure how to um, do that in Edina or where we would do it or how we would use the benefit, uh, how we would use those proceeds to, to uh, provide additional benefits. But like I said earlier, like that seems like the right kind of thing that we should be, um, we should be talking about. Um, and then I'll use an example um, to remember Jackson's point about if you have a roommate, you're in an apartment, um, you, we shouldn't necessarily restrict two roommates from having two vehicles. Well, I don't know that that's true, but we need to study that. There are um, apartment complexes that are in more highly dense areas that have a requirement that says you can't have more than one vehicle, and in some cases, it's less than one. But what they do is they provide sh a share option for that, those apartment units. And so you can, um, you could, um, I think one of them is called our car, right? And so that's what those are for. They're intended to drive down the need for parking, to eliminate um, vehicles it's from a sustainability perspective. They provide a benefit. And I think a lot of those, our cars are even electric, right? And so I think we have to not make an assumption on what individuals might want or desire, but go back to your point earlier, what are our goals? What are we really trying to accomplish? And then use um, policy, awareness, and education to drive towards that. Um, and so I, I really think that that approach makes a lot of sense. Um, and then the, the question that I did have, um, with what we are proposing today, uh, the mins and maxes and the minimums and maximums and then the square footage changes. Uh, do we have any sense of what, how that might impact? Uh, your one chart does show that 
we've had a ton of variances, and that actually is one of my red flags. If every time we have to have a variance, and that tells us there's something wrong with 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 our policy. Um, but have we thought about what the impact might be um, to restaurants or apartments um, with the, the current proposed ordinance changes? Yeah, I really would just go back to the recent projects because the developers we're talking to today, they seem to be asking for the same um, amount of parking. It's in that one, 1 1.3 spaces per unit range. Some go a little higher, up to the 1.5. Um, but I don't think it would impact. Again, the, there are way to, if we keep the maximums and they want a, a two units per apartment, you know, they can make that argument as part of a PUD and we could write that into the ordinance at that time. Um, and so we, we don't necessarily think there would be negative consequences um, as things are stated with uh, today. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Um, and so maybe the last point, I, I do think that um, we, should, we should continually be asking these questions and tweaking as we go, um, because that actually is the other red flag. If we're making a change to the ordinance and there is no sense of, of pain or growth, from those changes, then that does indicate that we need to go a little bit, we may need to go a little bit further. Um, and I think the measure pragmatic approach would um, will eventually get us there. So I, I applaud the way that you guys are thinking about it and the way that you've articulated it. So thank you. Thank you, Member Pierce. Go ahead and segue I, on that. I think that's a, yeah, I think, I think Member Pierce makes a great point about this chart being a philosophy change as opposed to maybe just a scale. And the example is, you know, this notion of providing off-street parking for your use it has not been with us forever. As a matter of fact, when we first started zoning, it was use and bulk. And this was kind of a latecomer in the 30s. And now it's been around so long, it's a philosophy. And it's, it's a philosophy built on presumptions that there's so much space that everybody can have their, you, you know, their own kind of kingdom, their castle on each lot, where you have everything. You have your parking, you have your use, you have your building, you have your space. And as we fill in and as we create an urban, more urban landscape, we don't want these seas of parking around each use. We want the uses and the buildings to create a place that we like better that isn't just cars next to buildings. And so this philosophy change is partly that, is partly saying, you know, we're still keeping these minimums, but we're moving toward a place where at some point we can start to say, no, maybe, maybe we don't have to have everybody provide all the parking on their site because if you can let go of that, then you can imagine a very different landscape for your building infrastructure, for your built environment. So I, I think that was a great point. Thanks. Member Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you. For, I know, I know that this was a mind-bending approach, and I know that there was a lot to consider. And, and part of it is, is that it, it's, 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 each one of these, of these zoning districts have their own usage, and I, I, it's difficult to find the, the exact right match. But I do think we should be changing our parking ordinance every 50 years or so, whether we need to or not. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, could you fill me in a little bit on the Nelson Nygaard report? I, it, it's referenced in here quite often, and I, it seems to be a, a kind of a guiding light. Yeah. Um, was it included in the packet this time? I'm not sure if it was in this packet. It's okay. been in the I, No, no. Oh, I've never got I've, I've asked for it 
offline. Well, I know that they're a consulting okay. firm. I, I don't know, so that, right and they have various reports that I could find. I didn't find anything applicable to our town, but in general, I know that that's it's been. Sure. I mean, it's a uh, from memory <laughs> on the spot. Um, it was like a 20-page report, something like that, um, and it um, it talked about parking benefit districts, and it talked about. Um, other cities, uh, it had several sections, uh, comparing it to other cities of similar size to Edina and how they're dealing with, with parking and how they're changing, dealing with parking moving into the future. Um, it dealt with uh, parking benefit districts and things from Professor Shoup about how, you know, his, his famous book on parking and how, you know, parking to some points that were made about, uh, you know, equity, for example, you know, parking isn't free. There's no such thing as free parking, right? So it, it, it speaks to those issues. Um, I'm trying to think what else it talks about. I think that it was really, I mean, they're a, a firm that would be kind of a partner, similar to what we've done working with consultants for, you know, small area plans. They were a partner that we consulted on as we were beginning to think about off-street parking ordinances. And so this is something that they're, they're experienced with. They've worked with a lot of cities. And so they really provided kind of some of what I included in here, like you need to think of it in its totality. Um, we we n shouldn't necessarily, you know, just be looking at off-street parking ordinances, but all of the things together, parking benefit districts, including things like paid on-street parking, um, because they are all tied together, right? Transportation plan and, and what our, our, you know, options are there tie in so tightly to what are our parking requirements. And so they, they could just be a really good partner. They went through a, a guide with us and we can absolutely make sure that, that it's available, especially given that we reference it, um, but just great partners in thinking about what have other cities done and what's a tactical approach to kind of change management in this sense. If I could add to that, I think they really helped us frame the big picture, not so much in the, the ordinance that's before you this evening, and that's why I didn't include it in the packet. It's really shaped all the slides that, that the commission has put together in thinking about the big picture. So I see them having a role in these next steps moving forward. I think another big part that they could be relied on for a partner is in the communication. Uh, because I, you know, even Commissioner Miranda, right, we can read the 500 page textbook on parking, which is great and I recommend it for everyone. But as we are, are trying to bring our community together and talk about these things, how do we communicate it in a way that, that other people see the vision, see the objectives, and can understand what the impact is? Um, I, we read through all of the same comments on Better Together. Overflow into neighborhoods is definitely th something that comes up a lot. Placing it together in, a, in an entire strategy and then communicating that strategy is something I really think that could offer our, our community members a lot of reassurances. And so that's why I think partnering with someone like that could be really beneficial. Okay, that's useful. Thank you very much. Um, and for, for uh, Director Teague, um, is the average basically for apartments, you know, you mentioned 1.3. My recollection is often we hear 1.5. That seems to be the number, but it's not two. But, but, and and I, I want to thank you for the comparison here, the project comparison, because it's, and this is kind of updated, uh, this one uh, from uh, two weeks ago. And I appreciate that because it's relieved a lot of my concerns because what I see here is that that many of our uh, approved projects are they fall under this ordinance so that's you say okay then that's working out um, the one notable one I think and it's been brought up here tonight is 6800 or the Southdale office thing. And I think back about that and there were significant design issues there I, I we felt I know that um, that kind of precluded that now they they really did they required or requested a lot of parking that there just wasn't space for and the water table was didn't allow them to go underneath and we never really got to the point where you could say let's zero in on this but i think that um my i, I, I when i look at why maximums i think that maximums by establishing them that it gives a range it allows some movement and that avoids variance requests i mean that's what we're trying to do is to avoid that some of these variance requests have been actually been 
to put in less parking than the minimums required, but there's still variance requests. So I, I feel a lot more comfortable uh, about that. So thank you for doing that. Um, could we move back to uh, uh, Member Staunton's favorite slide? <laughs> the phases. Thank you. Um, and you know we've chatted a little bit about these tonight. Um, I, as I as I look at this, I say we are here. I guess on the short term, um, yes, we're on the low side, and that's that. I think was your intent was to be low as we start, correct? What I what what I worry about is what I don't know. That's that's what I worry about. I what I I don't know as Member Pierce asked, is this going to be. Is this adequate? I mean, is this, are we going to have issues? Are we going to have variances? I don't know that. I don't know when we, when we lay out a scale of change, I don't know what people who are watching this and looking at this right now, developers, I don't know if they look at this and say, oh boy, look what these guys are planning and I don't know if we can go there. If they don't know, I don't know. And that's, so, that, that's what I worry about. I, 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 this ordinance is solid and I think it goes a long way to um, recognizing reality. And the, the, we can see from the comparison chart, the development community is, is correcting itself. We, we see that. They're, they're asking for less and building less. And so to recognize that and remove the possibility for maximums and overruns makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Um, I guess the only specific issue that I would bring to your attention, and I would like to have consideration on that going forward, is um, when we look at parking spaces for nursing homes, hospitals, hospices, I look at that and say, you know, every single one of those spaces is visitor parking. And we want to be very sensitive to that. And I, 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 that would be one area that I think we should take a good look at before we um, absolutely clean it up. Um, because I think that, I think that is a, um, a mistaken approach. Um, so that, that's my only concern and consideration here. Um, I worry, but we all worry. And so um, uh, thank you for your hard work. Thanks, everybody. Uh, great comments. And we've um, we put the onus on you so many times, I almost feel guilty about raising these supplemental issues. But uh, I carry some of the concerns that uh, Member Anderson has. Um, I think one of the, at least it seems to me, one of the keys in your analysis here is there, your belief that there's going to be an increased mass transit availability or to a more modest degree, you're promoting what I think the Minneapolis City Council wanted to promote was the use of mass transit. But we don't have the same kind of mass transit that they have there. And I doubt with the budgets that I see that, that it'll, it'll be decades before we have the kind of mass transit that, that we see in, the, in, a, in a dense urban environment. We're just not going to be part of that system that operates uh, in the same way it operates in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Now we're going to have a new ABRT line on France Avenue, which is a good thing. And that may be a, a, a reliever on some of the single occupant vehicles that we have. But nonetheless, uh, the, the small steps that you're talking about taking, I'm pretty comfortable <coughs> with. But uh, Member Anderson touched on one of them that I hadn't thought about, and that was um, uh, nursing homes. Uh, I've been primarily concerned here about what I'm seeing related to medical office and hospital. Because when I go over to Fairview Southdale uh, or I drive by Southdale Medical Center, the, every, every spot is full. And um, there's going to be more and more pressure on them, I think, over time. The hospital, you know, we, they may come with further remodeling. And I just want to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a situation right now where we're short of parking at a at a healthcare facility, and so now they've moved to the street. Now they've moved to Berry Road, and I don't know what your comments would be on that. But those those are the two main worries I have: our medical clinic and, and hospital. And we're going to see more and more of that as we develop and broaden out this medical campus. In fact, when I talked to 
the people at 6800 where my office is and asked, I just had a hallway conversation with the other day. They said they're coming back with a new, with a new plan for 6700 and 6750 that leaves the existing structures in place, but they're going to turn it into medical office. Oh, wow. Because they're getting so much demand for, from people and calls for a medical office. And so that's a whole different parking situation, I think, than just regular office. Mm -hmm. Um, which I was worried about at one time, and not, I'm not quite so worried about it. So I don't quite know what to do on medical office and the hospital. I'm a little bit reluctant to change those because of just what I see from an anecdotal standpoint and what I hear is coming. Um, and the apartments, or on any of these categories, I mean, did you actually go out and talk to people that were in the apartment business or in nursing home business to see what they thought their pack parking situation was or you know go to a medical office talk to restaurateurs office buildings yeah we didn't it was mainly just the developer um, developers yeah. doing the office and, and apartments and you had the data of course on what people have been asking for that are developing multifamily right. apartment buildings you had that data which showed that you didn't need 2.0 spaces per unit. So that's giving me a little bit of comfort there because I thought somebody raised a good point here about, well, what if you got a roommate and they, I think it was you, remember Jackson, uh, and they both want a car. Yes, Commissioner. Yeah, I think it's important to understand uh, when you talk about, um, uh, well, nursing homes are talking about potentially it being mostly for visitors. Um, but with a hospital, you're also talking about employees, right? And so I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, changing this uh, in the future, making it more restrictive, we'd have to understand what proportion of those spaces are used by employees and what proportion are used by visitors, for example. Because, for example, an employee may be more likely to take the BRT line, which goes right along uh, the hospital, for example. So, so I think that's, and that's partly why we talk about collaborating with the Transportation Commission, because I think these issues relate not just to land use, but it's also the transportation network and how that develops. And I think that the E-Line is going to be, cause more change than I think we're, some of us are expecting. And so I think it's important to understand the different people who park. Yeah, would, and if you look at the ordinance, it's, it's embodied in the ordinance. Uh, nursing, convalescent, rest homes, at least one space for every, used to be four, and now it's re recommended five patients or residents based on the maximum capacity building, plus one space per employee on a major shift, to your point, I think, plus one space per vehicle owned by the building's management. Member Stoughton? So I, I just wanted to address a couple of the concerns that you've raised. I think one is that I think, I think rather than being aggressive, this is a recalibration from requirements, minimum requirements that were kind of arbitrary and we didn't know and there were 1970s when land was available and you could just build as much as you needed to house as many cars as you needed and there's not as much need for that anymore. The other thing I would say about the medical office especially is there's no maximum there. And I think the developers of those products are going to have an incentive to make sure if they're going to be able to lease that space, their, their tenants want people to be able to walk from the parking lot into the, into the facility mm -hmm. and do it conveniently. So I think they're the, they're the governor on that. And, but, but in the big picture, I think these, you're, you're raising some good questions for the next stage. <laughs> But I think what we're doing is just recalibrating to get this in a range where we haven't talked to the development community because they've talked to us. Mm -hmm. They've said in every single application we get that this is all we need and, and their projects seem to be doing fine. I do think there will be some differences depending on location. So, you know, to the spillover notion. An apartment building in the Southdale area, there aren't many options to go park on the street, whereas the Lorient, there might be options to go park on the street. So we have to take that into account as we move forward, too. But, but I, I think this is, um, 
This is more of a recalibration for now, but we are going to start talking about the exact issues that you're identifying in terms of how do we how do we go forward in a change of philosophy. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the hospital. They just added 50 new rooms uh, for single occupants. And yep. uh, I don't know how that's add, affected their parking. Yeah, and and I, that for hospitals and nursing homes, there's no maximums no maximum, on those either. You know. Right, they're going to make sure they get enough parking. Get enough parking. You know, the, I'll, just to add to that, I do think, and I understand the, the concern um, that you're raising, and I think oftentimes it's a governor, for me personally, on how far forward I push, but I would say we actually have to have everybody shift their paradigm. And we haven't done the work to do that. And so this really is normalizing from 1970 for what we've done today. And then we do have to do the, the work to shift the paradigm of everyone in the community. And we have to lean into that. Um, and that's why that's to me that's when the work gets harder to do um, and I, I I like the approach of doing it this way and tongue-in-cheek to member Anderson renewing the ordinance every 50 years or so <laughs> I think looking at it with the right frequency allows us to shift um, and be dynamic as we go when Member Anderson mentioned that, it, it caused me to recall why we got in this whole conversation was on the Lorient, I think. And, and Member Fisher, at the time, he said, wait a minute, at least this is my recollection, wait a minute, he said, we're, we're providing the same sort of parking standards here that we provide at Southdale Mall. You know, it's, and that's that 50-year-old model. And, and then we asked the Planning Commission to fix it. And it needs it needs adjustment and the adjustment is small but i worry about any kind of chilling effect on economic development yes, sure. that's what i worry about and but we can always change it i guess if we have to and um mr mayor yes uh, i was rejection. i thought it was really interesting in the comments somebody said well developers don't want to provide parking at all and remember at some of these developments that we've looked at the cost of parking is astronomical and so i think they have a financial interest in not having to provide as much parking so i was kind of comforted by that that the market is actually kind of leading us this way all right well the uh, the two main concerns i had were the medical clinic and the, and the hospital issues and i think with um, with the conversation we've had and thinking about the fact that they're going to kind of right size their parking based on the fact that we don't have a, uh, the maximum in place i'm comforted there um so uh even though i you know i want to make these changes uh and i'm going to support it uh, the, the underlying situation for me is i don't want to do anything that causes us to have a, a downturn in our economic development activity and i guess we'll all be mindful of that as we move along here so um well thank you all for being uh, providing such great information and for leading your uh, your commissioners fellow commissioners in this exercise uh, all right, is there a motion to adopt uh, ordinance? Let's see here. Uh, motion to grant first reading of ordinance 2021-07. Do you want first reading or do you want to just wave? First? I think we would recommend first reading and we okay. would make those changes that were recommended by the engineering department. All right, let me, let me uh, restate the motion. Motion to grant first, is there a motion to grant first reading of ordinance 2021-07? Uh, plus the, uh, uh, the amendments there too as were suggested by our staff uh, members uh, regarding uh, these off-street parking regulations. So moved. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the motion of state to say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you.
The last two matters we have, we had in front of us a few weeks ago in the public hearing format, and now it is time for action one way or the other on these matters, and Director Teague has both of them. The school district applied for conditional use permits for both Concord and for Countryside Elementary for some work that was underway over there, and I'm just gonna to turn to Director Teague and we'll take them one at a time. We'll go with, the, uh, with Concord Elementary first. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Members of the, <clears throat> of the council at Concord, they're proposing a classroom addition. There's no changes to the on-site circulation, the parking areas. Um, we had no feedback from the last, from the time you held the public hearing until the public hearing closed last Monday. So staff and the planning commission are recommending approval of the conditional use permit that's subject to the conditions and findings in the resolution. Good. Any questions for Director Teague? All right. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 2022-62 which would approve the issuance of the conditional use permit uh, to the school district regarding Concord Elementary School? So moved. Second. All right, motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Pierce. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. <coughs> And then uh, resolution 2022-61 involves Countryside Elementary School. Back to Director Teague. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, a little more to this one. There were six classroom additions, and they were also reconfiguring the uh, parking lots to, for safety to separate bus traffic from parent drop-off from pedestrians moving on to the site. Uh, the Planning Commission added a condition that the school district consider EV charging stations and the school district, as we talked about at the last meeting, uh, they have agreed to that condition and they're gonna be including uh, the conduit for those EV charging stations um, when the project is built. So with that, again, uh, we didn't receive any additional feedback and staff and planning commission would recommend approval subject to the findings and conditions in the resolution. Questions for Director Teague? I've got one for you. Uh, some of the neighbors over there contacted me and I think one of the uh, I think the school district employee that was here uh, discussed it, but there was a, it was an extension of the berm over towards Stewart mm -hmm. to keep the light. you know the lights down early in the morning, late at night when people were coming and going, picking up kids. Is is that embodied in the resolution? I didn't see it in there. What's embodied in the resolution, in addition to the the berm that's proposed, is filling in the gaps in the landscaping. Um, there were several gaps around the perimeter on both streets, and the school district has agreed to fill those those areas in, subject to working with uh, Luther Overholt, the city the city forester. Okay, so that sounds to me more like uh, deciduous or, or conifer, as opposed to building up a, a bank or filling in a gap in a bank. Yes, yeah, it would be year-round evergreen screening, correct? Yeah. So what? So where's the language about filling in the gaps in the in the bank? Uh, that is. Yeah. So we're approving the plans, and the berm is in the grading plan, and the condition to fill in the gaps is one of the conditions listed in the resolution. All right. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to adopt resolution 2022-61, which would approve the issuance of the conditional use permit to the school district for the work they're doing at Countryside Elementary School? So moved. Second. Commissioner Jackson moves, Commissioner, Commissioner Pierce seconds. The motion is stated. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the motion, uh, uh, adopting resolution 2022-61, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And that is it for the bulk of the agenda this evening. Folks, thanks for your good work. Um, Madam Chair is still here from the Planning Commission. She just get, couldn't get enough of us yet tonight, so <laughs> thanks, thanks for sticking around. And then we're gonna go to the manager's comments, which would include an update, I think, on quarterly business reports and maybe some other matters as well. Manager uh, Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanna highlight one uh, particular item out of our uh, quarterly, uh, the Q2 business uh, business report. That is the the status of of uh, our permits building uh, 
uh, building valuation that we are seeing so far this year. Uh, we are at, by the end of June, uh, valuations totaling $254 million of new construction uh, in Edina the first half of, of this year. That compares with $170 million from the same time last year, so it's a 50% increase. And uh, we will exceed, without a doubt, we will exceed $300 million uh, this year in new construction for the first time in the city's history. Um, that is a very significant amount of, of, of growth. Um, in the community in terms of valuation growth, and it will, uh, if we do that a couple of years in a row, that will make a material difference in, in our tax base, and residents will, will feel that in a few years in terms of uh, the way that we're going to have a bigger pie to spread our, our local government spending over. So it's significant. Thank you, Major mm -hmm. Neal. Anything else? No. Nope. All right. Uh, Council Member Jackson. Nice to have you back with us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's lovely to be back. It was hard to watch from home last time, but you did a great job. I was cheering you on. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I want to thank the police department, and especially Officer Jepson, for organizing Night to Unite last night for us. It was a great event. I went out with Deputy Chief Olafsky and... Um, uh, Officer Davis, and we saw a lot of kids, uh, love the flashing lights on the car, and I just want to thank everybody who worked to organize and just to show up to the Night to Unite. It was, it was a great evening, and it was fun to see people get together again. Um, I've been looking at the, um, we saw the sketch plan for the proposed lifetime towers, and I, I have been reading about that and, and talking about it, and one thing that came up that I was thinking about was about park dedication fees. And um, I don't know whether we can have park dedication fees for this, but we're looking at potentially a lot of new residents. And I think that they'll put some stress on our parks. Um, so I'd really like to see what the requirements could be or how much money would be involved in that to, to look at park dedication fees. Um, and uh, I'm glad we had a good discussion about 56th Street. It's been a, a lot of complaints and, and con kind of confusing things, so I hope that we get that all straightened out for those guys. It, it seems like it's been a long project for the Melody, St Melody Lake um, reconstruction. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to jump around a little bit, um, just uh, of note. Um, uh, the beauty league attendance over at Braemar is really high. I mean, they're doing great over there. Uh, Monday the 27th, they sold uh, almost 1,200 single tickets. Um, sold 100 season passes the first day out. I mean, that's... What nights of the week do they play? Uh, Mondays, Mondays, I Mondays. guess. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I thought they were two nights, but I'm seeing these reports on Mondays, but Maybe they're only for Mondays. Yeah, Those, they're, that's a compilation. Yeah, okay. It's Monday, Wednesday, right? Yeah. Yeah, they used right. to play on Wednesday. And now they play twice a week? Or? Yes, Monday, Wednesday. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, but the report is only issued on Mondays. Okay, so and I just think that's a, that's a piece of good news. Um, and last night was really fun. Uh, I, what I noticed last night, particularly, are the numbers of young children that you know, we're not really out in force the last time out. There were a zillion kids out last night, and I th that's that's really kind of fun. Um, and uh, I can tell you of one who was wearing a biking helmet, but jumped into the back of the police car and would not get out because it was so. Uh, I, I happen to be related to her, so I know about this, and. Um, I, uh, that was surprising. She belted herself in. <laughs> and and I, the only thing I could think was, well, I hope it's your last time in the back seat of a police car. I mean, <laughs> once is enough. Um, I, you may, Mr. Mayor, uh, discuss a little bit Deputy Counsel uh, Eschheim's uh, here last week. Well, but go ahead. Yeah, it was, uh, the, I think initially, uh, Dr. Eschheim uh, invited our uh, our uh, council as a whole and possibly a few others and uh, the uh, Mayor Hubland and I were able to attend that with several other uh, people in the area electeds and uh, it was a fascinating experience. Number one, we got to draw them into the Cahill Bistro and so that's really some local color and they did a great job there. But um, the insight into what's occurring in the Mideast 
and uh, his perspective on it was fascinating. And I think I felt that we really got a lot of firsthand information and uh, um, it was reassuring. <clears throat> that conversation was reassuring about our relationship with Israel and how that was viewed by uh, the deputy council. So um, I, that was one a, a very unique experience. And so I want to thank him for extending the invitation and thank you for setting all of that up with all the people involved. And every single one of them appreciated it. So it thank was, you. Thank you. It was a good cross section of uh, elected officials and a few Sorry. others thrown into the mix. Yes. All right. And that, anything else? That's it. All right. Great. OK. Thank you. Uh, Member Sutton? Nothing for me. Member Pierce? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just two quick things. Um, one, um, the National Night Out was awesome. Um, uh, I had my daughter, Caitlin, with me, and so we had a good time. Um, but the one thing that I wanted to highlight, and I think this is the reason we do this. So we were at um, the Village Street um, location, and um, we were about to leave, and one of the uh, residents came up and pointed to Amundsen Flats. And I was prepared for complaints or something like that. Um, but she keeps talking about it, and, and I'm not quite sure where we're going. But then the president says, you know, we should have better outreach. Um, than we have right now. And there are lots of kids in, in that apartment complex, and so she's pointing. Um, and apparently she had walked over and um, talked to the, the manager about National Night Out, and um, it was a little bit too late for them to try to plan something. And then she said, you know what we ought to do? And she's talking to their president, uh, their their association, you know what we ought to do next year? We should have one person plan both of them and then we could do it jointly. And I just thought, you know, I'm prepared because we have had issues over there. <laughs> I'm prepared for that. And um, I just thought it was a wonderful example of our community trying to, to come together. Um, so they took the, the, um, the to-do for next time to reach out and try to plan something together. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then my other one, I, um, I was at Braemar, I think this might have been last Saturday, and I'm at the driving range, and I'm focused, I'm dialed in, and then I hear somebody trying to give golf balls away, and they're pretty loud about it. <laughs> So I turn around and it was, it was the mayor. <laughs> and we were on the far left side. You didn't even see didn't me. See You're right. You didn't even see me. No. We were on the far left side. And uh, I think um, the mayor turned to the, uh, some young kids that were right next to him and asked, hey, you want these balls? They didn't want them. No, it was too hot. I mean, it was too hot. And <laughs> And <laughs> Jim walked all practically right. all the way to the other side, <laughs> golf being balls, the yeah. mayor, trying to spread some goodwill with giving away those golf balls. And so I thought that was, uh, I thought that. <laughs> I wish I, said, I would have seen you there. <laughs> so you I thought, I thought that was funny. Ball. I could have given you some golf You could have given yeah. me some, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you didn't holler, I'll take them. <laughs> right, right, right. So I thought it's um, it's really cool to um, just be out in the community and been see folks that we're working with uh, yeah. out enjoying our great community. So that gave me a gave me a chuckle. Yeah. And that's you. it. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions for Director Milner. Uh, as we talked about 56th Street, uh, Member Jackson talked about it. it. Reminded me that we've got some issues on 58th as well that we need to deal with both east and west of France. We've had several people contact us about that as well, and I'm assuming you're going to send some folks over there to look at the condition of things there as well, both correct. east and west of France. Yep, correct. We have a list of properties, and we're looking at um, 
the property proper and then also the little strip of boulevard area which mm -hmm. we typically don't like because we know it's notorious for not growing grass so we suggest daylilies and other ground cover so we're yeah. asking people if they want to switch to some of those plants um, and we're going to correct some of those tougher areas all okay time. good that's good to hear same sort of customized approach you're going yep, to take that is over there as you did on 56 yep. because i noticed when i was on 58th uh the the yards that decided to put in those lilies they're they're doing great they're tough exactly and they look wonderful but the, some of the other boulevard areas look pretty bad yep. so thanks for that and then um uh 50th and france traffic study you, did you get somebody lined up for that on that east-west study? Yep, we're working with TKDA on that. They're putting together a proposal right now. We told them we wanted to get that expedited. So once we see their proposal, I'll review that with Manager Neal, and we'll keep moving forward on that. So okay. we did get approval from Met Transit. They're going to give us all the data. They're going to give us all their models so we can start with review their assumptions and review that model and start from there. All right. I mentioned it to a couple of folks at the Southwest LRT meeting today that are on the Met Council that we were going to do this study. So yep. I think all of you know that the, the big conversation with the Met Council is not about whether we want uh, the E line, the ABRT line going down France Avenue, but where to put the stations. And they want them right at 50th in France. And we're suggesting that they should be down at 51st in France because once you start running those articulated buses, especially in the PM peak, when you got all those people going east. Our instinct is that it's just going to be a, uh, even more congestion. Yeah, and, and, and the council has previously approved that policy yeah. uh, option. So we're, we really are kind of sticking with something the council has right. asked for. I had a meeting this morning with a couple of Minneapolis City Council members that wanted that run the tab. One is a member, Emily Kosky and Elliot Payne, who is the alternate. And um, um, Emily Kosky, who is, I think, District 11, she said they, they had the same issue at 48th in Chicago, where they wanted to put it right at the corner, and they tried to get them to move it south without success. But it's going to have to be a data-driven uh, proof to be able to get them to change their mind, I think. And I think, it's, it's, I think just instinctually it's critical that we, get it, we try to get it moved down further, those stations. So just an observation. Um, so uh, Member Anderson mentioned uh, Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel Ashheim uh, is the Deputy Consul General for Israel for the Midwest based on Chicago. And uh, they'd gotten a hold of me because I had been in Israel with a dozen mayors back in late March, early April, and wanted to come up and he wanted to meet with some elected officials. So um, uh, I was able to gather up about maybe, a, what do you think, a dozen so? Yes. People? Yeah. And um, it, was a, it was a real really wonderful lunch and he was real gracious about inviting us all down to Chicago and, and any time we're there get a hold of him so um, that was a, a really a, a nice experience um, I've, I had uh, Jennifer Garski send out to all of you uh, the materials on Southwest LRT I thought this was a pretty interesting uh, quarter management committee meeting in terms of the update of it and I asked Director Benerot to just pull. I thought I thought you ought to see the, and I think for our uh, members of our community, see the the civil stage that we're at on the civil engineering stage. And this is this is going to be it here. And she, I think Director Benerot will just run the screen here. So uh, you know, you think about the twenty. It's still uh, 2027 for projected beginning of operations. But look at uh, how far along they are. And if you look at the overall system, they'd probably be in that 60 to 70 percent completion range. So here's go ahead and just scroll. I think you can you can see the stations in in uh, Minnetonka and, and uh, you just saw one of the stations in Eden Prairie. There's three out there. Downtown Hopkins. That's a nighttime photo of that station. It's going to be a real nice station. There's that bridge over um, Excelsior Boulevard. You've probably all seen that. Go ahead, just keep scrolling. And uh, yeah, there's a little bit more distant view of that. Um, and then Blake Road and Hopkins, as many of you know, there's a bunch of work being done at that intersection with Excelsior Boulevard. Um, there's a, one of the St. Louis Park stops, and you can just keep going. I think people can see the Beltline St. Louis Park close to completion. And then these uh, these secant piles that they're driving in the in the Kenilworth corridor. 
it's going to take a while to get that work done yet and they've got a temporary bike path open there um, and then they're working on the Kenilworth uh, LRT tunnel too uh, at the same time they're putting in those secant pilings and then there's a new Cedar Avenue bridge um, and then there's one that's being used by just a section over in Bryn Mawr neighborhood to get over and get access you can see all of the work that's that's been done here go ahead and just scroll on I I think it's pretty fascinating. That's uh, that's the only bridge I think in Minneapolis. So uh, and that's about it. Thank you, Director Benarat. Um, and I wanted uh, all of you to see the, that update and uh, see those notes as well. You can see the in you can see the impact from an economic standpoint. Um, they had the city development updates from Dave Lindall out in Eden Prairie. Um, they're projecting. Um, oh, in Minnetonka and uh, I forget what it, they're over. I think they're over $2 billion in, in uh, development so far uh, in those three towns of Eden Prairie, Minnetonka and Hopkins. So that was, uh, there's some really some good stuff going on for those communities that are on the line. Um, and then uh, Council Member Jackson mentioned uh, Jeff Alasky that she was with him part of the evening last night. He's our deputy chief, as many of you know, has been with the city about 30 years and announced his retirement yesterday. Uh, and is gonna retire, I think, uh, end of, uh, 19th of August is what I remember him saying. So we'll have to celebrate him a little bit. Maybe we can get him here for our next meeting and maybe tell him how much we appreciate him. Um, with respect to the project down on, uh, at uh, Weber Woods, uh, in the stormwater management project we got going on down there. Uh, when I've been down at 50th in France, I see the side dumpers coming through there, hauling dirt back and forth. It's, it's really, I don't know how they're managing that, but it, 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 you know, you wish you could steer them in a different direction. Why don't you go north on Excelsior Boulevard and, mm -hmm. or go on France Avenue and go to Excelsior Boulevard and go out to 100 and go around, but they're going up and down France Avenue. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but boy, it looks, it's, it's kind of harrowing when you see those big trucks coming down through that tight intersection. Yeah, I'd say it's that project, but there's other other development projects in the area too. We watch, we actually Ross was out there watching and seeing which trucks are which, and because we got some complaints on trucks yeah. and it's a, public a lot road. of them. It's a public road. There's yeah, lots of cement road. trucks, lots of other trucks too. So yeah. it's not just yeah. ours. And and then I did the mayor's minute uh, today on something I thought was worth mentioning at the council level too. And I don't know if we've got that phone number. Director Benarat for FEMA, but um, the federal, uh, apparently Congress uh, passed as part of the uh, COVID packages that they worked on and the, I suppose in conjunction with ARPA and everything else, they're offering $9,000 to people to help with funeral expenses uh, for COVID related deaths. And we brought it up today in uh, the mayor's minute because we had four folks just recently passed away again from COVID. So, Five uh, as of today. To the extent that folks want to be able to take advantage of that opportunity with those federal funds, you've got to call in to a particular number. Yeah, that number is 844-684-6333. Why don't you repeat it one more time? Sure, please. that number it's is 844 684 -6333. As you mentioned, Mayor, you do have to call. It takes about 20 minutes to apply over the oh, phone. There it is. Okay. And it's open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. All right, good. Thanks for that, Director Benarat. Um, yeah, that's it on, on my list, so. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> your comments on F France Avenue and 50th and France reminded me, I went to a meeting um, that Hennepin County held uh, with the residents on France. They're talking about a restriping project. Oh, good. And I think that we've heard about that. Um, I attended and there were two business owners there from 44th and France. And so what they're proposing is eliminating parking on France and creating a bus line, striping, or, or striping a bike lane um, instead. And there were 
numerous complaints from people who live there concerned, especially from elderly people, that their guests would have a long walk then to their home um, and not be able to, to have family visit and things like that. So I'm, I'm going to write up a report and send that. Um, I've been... I think I sent it to Manager Neal and Andrew Scipioni, and I will be submitting some comments on that. Okay, that's, that'll be good. Yeah. Now, I know the merchants on 44th and France have really been concerned about loss of on-street parking. Right. R right. And rightly so, I think. Yeah. And I think uh, Commissioner Latondras is sensitive to that, too. At least we've had conversations yes. with him about that. Yeah. So. Thank you. All right. I think that's it. Did that prompt anything else from any other council members? I think Councilmember Anderson is recommending to get out and see the Beauty League folks. You can still get there tonight. <laughs> I did, uh, incidentally, meet uh, one of our residents, Zach Parisi, who was uh, at one of the high school grad parties I was at. So it was fun to meet him. He and his mother were there. All right. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We got a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Pierce, that we adjourn the meeting of the City Council on this third day of August, 2022. Anything further? All right. Uh, those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. We stand adjourned. <laughs>